So continuing on that building process today, what we want to talk about is something called encumbrances, which is a really fancy sounding word, but it's not that fancy of a concept. An encumbrance is a limitation. Here's a way to think about it. it because, and I always am grateful to Seth for reminding me to be in this mindset, um, it, which is that we need to constantly have a reminder of sort of where we are on that linear sort of chart of things and the way of thinking. Uh -huh. Encumbrances are appurtenances, folks. We haven't left appurtenances behind as, an, as a topic. We're talking about specific types of appurtenances now. So remind me, what is an appurtenance when it comes to real estate? When, when we say something is appurtenant to the real estate, what do we mean when we say that? Permanent. It's just attached to it forever. It runs with the land. Forever. Runs with the land. It's attached to the land. It's permanently a part of the land. Now, some appurtenances you can see, like a building is appurtenant to the property. I gotta stop reaching out at the camera. That's weird. It's like <laughs> coming to get yeah, you. You definitely change your setup. I mean, you used to have your camera up here, and yeah, right. I've got to get used. I've got to get used to the. Yeah, I'm coming to get your brain. <laughs> um, I gotta get used to the fact that my camera's right there. Um, but appurtenances are just anything that is permanently attached to the property. Encumbrances are appurtenances that are bad. Some appurtenances are good, like water rights. We talked about like having riparian rights or littoral rights. Well, that's a good thing, the, the, the right to access water. That's a great thing. Why, in fact, why do people buy waterfront property? Because they want to have the right to access that water from their property. And it's a and good thing to have. That's a it's good appurtenance. Right. Encumbrances, these are the not so good. This is the fleas yeah. come with the dog section of the class. These are the, fleas. <laughs> these are the fleas. These are the fleas. That's exactly right. And so encumbrances are anything that's going to be attached to the property when it transfers from owner to owner that in some way limits what the owner of the real estate can do with that property. It's going to be seen as a negative thing. So let me point I may, out. What was there that? Is going, there's going to be several types of encumbrances throughout this chapter. So just keep this in the back of your mind that this entire thing is encumbrances. That's exactly right. The entire section is encumbrances. And we're going to talk about different types of So we're going deeper and deeper and deeper in those layers of detail, right? We talked about a cum, encumbrance, or we talked about appurtenances. Now we're deeper diving into encumbrances, which are a type of appurtenance. And then we're going to go even deeper into that. What are the different kinds of encumbrances? What are these limitations? Before we go forward, though, and we're not really at a section yet where we want to talk about disclosure, but I think this is so important. Do you think that it is important for buyers to find a way to know these limitations before they take ownership of this property. Yes. 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 Because folks, what did we say about a deed transferring ownership? It's too late after it's been what? Recorded. After it's been recorded. After the deed is done. Remember that expression? The, the, yeah. Once you have a deed, it's done. It's over. You're not going to change things. It's too late for a buyer to find out that they have these restrictions, they have these encumbrances after they bought the property. It's, you got to deal with them now. The mm -hmm. time to figure this out for buyers is before they take ownership of the property. Nobody is twisting their arm. Remember, to take ownership, they have to voluntarily be willing to take ownership of the property. Oh. It, there's it's only nothing better for them to know what they're getting themselves into. So right. that's why we need to make sure they need to figure out, do we have any restrictions? Do we have any fleas 
that come with this property that could potentially make it less desirable or simply we don't want it at all. That's exactly right. So let's talk about the different types of fleas and ticks that might be associated with this property when you take ownership of it. A cuss um, word in my house, okay? Don't let Macy hear that word. Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> I, that's why I'm thankful now that both of our dogs are short hair because uh, yes. you know, when we had long hair dogs, the ticks, it's just, it's like the never ending hunt. Wait, let me see. Let me we see. Have chickens. Chickens uh, take care of that in my house, Travis. Oh, yeah. You hope they do. Oh, we don't have, knock on wood, we don't have any ticks, uh, tick oh, issues with Macy. So. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so the first type of fleas that might come with the property. So this, is, again, deeper dive into types of encumbrances is something called an easement. An easement is an encumbrance. An encumbrance is a type of restriction that comes with the property. An easement, from the perspective of the property owner, folks, Talk to me. Good thing or bad thing? From the perspective of the owner of the real estate, is an easement a good thing or a bad thing? Bad, 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 thing. bad. bad thing. It's exactly right. An easement is a bad thing from the perspective of the property owner because what an easement does permanently is gives someone other than the owner the right to access and use a portion of that land. I'll say that again. It permanently gives someone other than the owner the right to access and use that land. Now, when we say the right, I want you to be clear about something. Can the owner change their mind once an easement has been granted? Can the owner of the real estate change their mind once an easement has been granted? No. 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 And that right there is the difference between permission and an easement. The fancy, the fancy word for permission is a license. A license is the right to do something for a limited period of time. But licenses always expire. Permission can be taken away. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. yes. Easements are permanent permission, which means easements cannot be removed with redeeding the property because the easement is part of the property. Isn't that why it's under an appurtenance? What did we talk about appurtenances? They stay on the property for how long? Forever. Forever. That's why they're written under an appurtenance. Well, and remember, property. every time we redeed the property, we can only add restrictions to it. We can't do what with them, folks? Take them away. Take them away. away. You can't take them away. Now, that doesn't mean there's no way to remove easements. Can a court of law do anything that a court of law wants to do? Yep. Yes. 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 But from a practical standpoint, there is no practical way that the owner of a piece of property can remove an easement from their own property. Because here's the way the law works. When they took ownership of that property, what were they agreeing to do? Give that right to some to somebody who holds that easement for how long forever forever, forever. and so the courts would look at you and say why do you want to change the rules now you knew this was here when you took ownership you don't get to change the rules now yes, now stupid. now if the person <laughs> or company who benefited from the easement wanted to release you do you think that would be probably the best way to get rid of an easement? Yeah. Or kill him. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if Sorry, I'm just, gonna, I'm just savage. There's today. always murder. Exactly. I mean, exactly. It's a lot of stuff. So, but, but in general, easements don't grant ownership to the easement holder. What they do is they grant everything else, use, enjoyment of that part of the property without granting ownership. Who still owns the land? The owner. The owner does. So who is responsible for maintenance of the land and paying taxes on the land, even the, the land that includes the easement? The owner. The owner. The owner. 
The owner also gets to use the area of the easement, but what they can't do is restrict the use of the easement holder. The easement holder has the right to access that property. Is that, is that starting to click for everybody in your brain about what an easement really is? That would be good for the easement elite. holder. Okay. And All right. it, as Seth just said, this is a huge win for the easement holder. Yes. The easement holder, you know, like there's the old expression, why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? Exactly. Right? Would you rather own the real estate or have an easement over the real estate? Knowing that if you have an easement, you get to use it, you get to enjoy it, you never have to pay taxes on it, you never have to maintain it. It's far better to have the easement than it is to actually own the land in, so, in, the, in some ways, right? Get all the benefits without any of the obligations. That's it. Oh, yeah. It's exactly right. Now, easements come in two varieties. I would expect a test question on the national section of the exam. This is all national. I would expect a test question on the national section of the exam where you're going to be asked to differentiate between the two different types of easements. One is called an appurtenant easement and the other is called an easement in gross. And they're going to ask you to differentiate the two of them. Now, a pertinent easement, these are the basic definitions. A pertinent easement's always involve two side-by-side -side properties, two pieces of land, not just one. Now, the easement is not going to be on both pieces of property. The easement is going to be on one of those two pieces of property. And the other property is going to benefit from that easement. That's an appurtenant easement. We're going to talk more about that right now. Whenever you have an appurtenant easement, how many pieces of property did I say we had? Two. 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 So let's look at this picture right here for a second. This is an overhead view of two lots. Now I've inserted a blue line there where the property line is. Um, Seth, you want to help me out and do your magic? Give me a highway on the right hand side over there, if you don't mind yeah. while I talk. Um, so let's say the highway is off to the right hand side of your picture there. And Seth is adding that in for me over there. Because your drawing sucks. Do you, exactly. Do you see, do you all see a problem for either of these lots as far as accessing that highway from their land? Which lot has a problem accessing the highway from their land, assuming that this is the only way of access. Which lot has a problem? One. one. Lot one. Lot one has a problem. It doesn't have a driveway to get. It to doesn't the... have a driveway. Lot mm -hmm. two has no problem of access. Lot two has a driveway. They can go come. They got no. And so that's what you need to see here. The problem is not on lot number two. The issue is not on lot number two. The issue, the, the lot in need is lot number what? One. 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 Lot one. number one. Lot what number one mean? needs help. Is everybody okay with that? Is it safe to say, Travis, that usually these type of easements are when we're trying to fix a problem? We're trying to find a solution? To easements it? almost always address a problem. And so here's the problem that happened. And apparently the North Carolina Department of Transportation is doing continual work because we've gone from a passing zone to a double yellow line. <laughs> to, uh, we're um, fixing the potholes. Exactly. We're fixing the problem. These easements are almost always created to address a problem. So here's, here's the problem. Somebody recognized that lot number one has an issue. Does that, does that make sense for everybody? Uh-huh. Lot number one needs help let's say lot number one went to the state and said we need a, we need a driveway and the state's like nope road's too busy you can't put another driveway because the north carolina department of transportation does that folks yes they will say no way this is too busy of a highway we cannot put another driveway in here because it's going to create a traffic hazard the other driveway has been there for 50 years we can't do anything about that driveway but we're not letting you put a new driveway sorry you shouldn't have bought a lot that didn't have access to the road on it. They will do that. The state is under um, no obligation to let you put a driveway accessing that roadway. Are we all good on that? Yep. Okay. 
And so if assuming they're not going to let lot number one put a driveway in, lot number one only <laughs> has one recourse to ask somebody else who does have access to the road and who is very nearby that does have access to the road. Neighbor. Lot dose. Lot number two. Can we use your driveway? Not can we share ownership of the driveway, but can we use your driveway? Well, now that's just asking for permission. That's all well and good, but what's the problem if we just handle it that way? If we just say, can we use your driveway, what's going to be the eventual problem for lot number one, folks? Lot two might change their mind. Lot two may change their mind. That's exactly right. So maybe you know, lot two owner sell it to somebody else, and the next ooh. owner will say, "Screw you! I'm not going to let you." That was the deal you had with you and Jay person. are on exactly the same wavelength. All, you put that in the all chat I want right to say, yep. is that lot number one is sounding really needy. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my laughs> they are needy, and so. <laughs> If you own lot number one, you'd be very nervous about only having permission. And would that make lot number one really hard to sell oh, yeah. if you didn't yeah, yes. have some sort of permanent <laughs> access? Yeah. Because a buyer would go, wait a minute now, I, I have to use the neighbor, I have to use the next door driveway. What do you have in writing that says I can always do that? Oh, well, no, the, they, that guy's cool over there. He's he awesome. Talked about it, you know. You know. Drinking beer. Folks, that's not going to work long term. What we need is something much stronger than that. We need something that's going to be tied to these properties. And notice I said tied to these properties. Which deed, to answer Luis's question, which deed needs to make reference to this easement that we're about to create? Lot two. Number two. Oh, just lot number two? No, lot oh, one. I both guess of them. both of them. Both of them. How about both of them? Because the deed for lot number one needs to say, use the driveway where? Lot number two. Oh, lot, lot number, number two. two. And the deed for lot number two needs to say what? Granting the permission for yeah. lot number you one. You have to allow lot number one to use your driveway. So a pertinent easement, folks. Do you notice why it involves how many pieces of property? Two. 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 How many deeds are going to make reference to this easement? Two. 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 We're only creating one easement, but it's one easement that impacts both pieces of property. Does that make sense for everybody? That's yes. the way I see it. Yes. How many pieces of land, how many lots is this easement affecting or, you know, uh, being a part of? And this is going to come handy when we talk about the other type of easements that we have. So that's why we are hammering this too. It applies to both lots. Just because lot one is the only one benefiting from it does not mean that lot two is not involved. Lot two is a part of it. So it is, it's affecting lot two. It might affect it negatively, but it's still affecting it. So what we need is essentially to draw a section of lot number two. We're not transferring ownership. But on a portion of lot number two, obviously the owner of lot number two gets to use the driveway. But what we need to do is grant permanent permission for whoever happens to own lot number one to also use that portion of lot number two. Does that make sense for everybody? What you're yeah. saying is if lot number one gets sold five years from now and the new owner comes in, Doesn't are matter. they still going to have access to that easement or is it going away with the old owner? What do y'all think? If lot number two, if lot number one gets sold later, is the easement going to stay or is it going to go away? Hey, if lot number two gets sold, is the easement going to go away or is it going to stay? It's going to stay. It's permanent. Jay, yeah, you had a question. I see your hand up. Yeah, I understand how the easement stays. What my question is, what if the owner of lot number two refuses to legally um, move forward with that easement? Then lot number one is screwed. Yep. Right. Simple okay. as, as simple as that. There's nothing that obligates lot number two. And folks, if there are two separate owners here, 
is lot number two going to want to do this? Is this something they want to do to give some other lot access over their land? No. No, probably uh, not. How do you money. convince people to do things? Money. That they money. Don't do? No. You pay the them. Money. My guess is my guess is the owner of lot number one is going to have to pay the owner of lot number two a one-time sort of price. And, and to convince them to create this easement. If you own lot number two, could you say to the owner of lot number one, sure, I'll uh, create the easement, but here's what I want. I want $50,000 right now. And I want you to agree to split the cost of maintaining the driveway forever. Could, could you make those demands if you own lot number two? Yes. 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 And that's just the negotiation that's going to happen between those parties as the easement gets created, folks. You don't need to worry about that. That's beyond our pay grade. That's between these two parties to figure out how that relationship is going to work. What you need to understand is we've reached a point where, for whatever reason, lot number two is okay with creating this easement. Whatever it took to talk them into it, they're okay with it. Now, actually, I'm going to tell you how this normally gets created. This normally happens when lot number two and lot number one are first created as real estate separate lots. Mm -hmm. Folks, what you need to understand, land's been here for a long time. Yep. If you go far enough back in time, don't lots get bigger and bigger and bigger because they've been subdivided as time went on, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. If we go far enough back in time, what, what line goes away on this thing? The easement. The, the, blue easement one goes the away. lot line. The lot line. The blue line goes away. At some point in time, wasn't this just one big piece of land owned by one person? Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. At some point in time, if you go far enough back in time, somebody owned all of this land as one lot and decided to do what with it? Sell it. Subdivide it. Sell it. Subdivide it. That's probably when the easement got created. It's very easy to create an easement over a piece of land when you own what? The whole property. Both of them. When you own you both of them. You're going to negotiate with yourself, right? How much exactly. should I pay myself for you? And, and Louise, <laughs> Louise, that's a great question from a practical standpoint. But again, that's beyond our pay grade. Louise asks, wouldn't lot number two get screwed because they have to fix the driveway? It's yeah. their driveway. So sure. Assuming they didn't come to some agreement to get both of them to participate, the driveway belongs to lot number two. So they've got to maintain the driveway. That's but that's... Funny. That's why it's important to look at the individual easement and how it's written. Is there an agreement? Here's the thing. If you were buying lot number one, would you want to see that? Yes. 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 Does that mean it would have to be in writing? Yes. Yes. And furthermore, folks, to make it permanently attached to land, what's the only way you can make it permanently attached to the land? Deed. Put, it on the deed. Deed. Put it on the deed. And what do we do with that deed that makes it permanent and available to the public so everybody can see it from now to the end of time? Record it. Record. Record. So here's the test question. Does an easement need to be recorded in order to be enforceable by a court of law? Yes. 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 Yes, it, easements are completely meaningless unless they've been put in a deed and recorded. Does that make sense for everybody? They're not yes. enforceable yep. if, they're not, if they're not recorded. It's just a handshake at that point. Exactly. So as soon as lot number one is able to talk lot number two in this easement, put it in writing and then take it where? To the courthouse. To the courthouse to, the courthouse to record it. And as soon as that happens, how long is this easement going to last, folks? Forever. 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 Now, help me out here. Since we have two properties, we need to name these properties. One of these is going to be called the servient property. 
Lots one of them is going to be one. called the dominant property. Which one do you think is servient? Which one is providing a service? Number Lot two. number two. Lot number two, Lot okay. number two is servient. And Serving. number one is what? Dominant. 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 How many of you feel all right about that now? That's I'm your permanent that easement. What, you good with that, Praveen? Yes. Okay, good. That's your pertinent easement right there. Involves two pieces of property side by side. Jay, why does it seem backwards? Because it seems like lot number two can dominate lot How? number one. How? Let me ask you a question. Because they can refuse it. No, they can't. No, they can't. Now, no. You're so focused, Jay, on the creation of the easement. We don't care about the creation of the easement. We are talking about the easement exists. We are Already talking there. about once the easement is in place, get past the creation of the easement. That's happened. That's in the past. From that point forward, who is dominant in the relationship? The employer or the employee? The person cleaning the house or the person sitting on their ass watching TV? Who's <laughs> dominant? The employer. It's always the employer. It's always the one who's not doing the work. Which property is doing the work here? One serving. Two. Two. And so lot number two is servient. So lot one way that I remember, um, and hopefully this will help, uh, remember, servient is serving. Lot number two is serving a driveway to lot number one. They're serving the product. They're serving the permission, the access. They have to weed eat that thing. So they got, they, Exactly. They got, so they got to maintain it. And here's the other thing. They have to leave a portion of their land usable to somebody else. Yeah. Forever. Does lot number one have to give up any of the rights in their own land? No. 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 Lot number one has all of the rights in their own land plus some <laughs> rights in some other property. Lot number two, lot number two doesn't even have all the rights in their own land. Does that help, Jay? When you when you look at it that way? Yeah, and we have to look at it from the point of view of the easement, not the owner of the land. That's what helps me. It's That's like exactly what it is. That is a great point, Christina. You're looking at it from the standpoint of the easement. From the standpoint of the easement, the work is being done by lot number two. Lot, be lot number two is being used and abused here. Yep. Therefore, it's servient. Lot number one. Meanwhile, here's the thing. It's going to snow on Friday. It's going gonna, it's gonna to know... It, it, and subservient and servant mean the same thing. You're not getting them mixed up. You're just too focused on before the easement exists and not on while the easement exists. When it snows on Friday, who's got to shovel the snow? The owner of lot number two or the owner of lot number one? Number two. Lot number two. Who gets to sit in their warm house and watch and laugh while their neighbor shovels the snow? Well, lot, one. lot number oh, one. one and folks if lot number two doesn't shovel the snow lot number one can sue them hit it because that is a permanent agreement now shay said unless otherwise agreed sure they could have the easement could specify that we're going to share maintenance but if it doesn't who does all of that fall to lot two lot two i have a question Yes. Sorry. Um, would there ever be a situation that so lot two initially had the entire property and then they went ahead and split it? Would there ever be a situation that lot two says, I don't want to be the servient property. I want it to be on the other property. I, is there ever a situation that would are make asking, sense? Are you asking about when the easement was first created again? Yeah, like say it's created and lot two is the main person of the property. Would Move the damn property line, Raquel? Move Raquel, the property here's, line. The, here's the thing. You're again, you're too focused on what doesn't matter here. We don't care about the creation of the easement. They created the easement for whatever suited them best, period. That's what they did. You're asking me, would there ever be a situation? There's a situation for everything. 
Yes. We, okay. when, the, when one person owned this land, they had to decide, do I want to put the easement on lot number two or do I want to put the easement on lot number one because they're only going to let me have how many driveways? One. One driveway. They flipped a coin. I don't know how they decided and I don't care and neither should you. Okay. Because we're not focused on, y'all are so nosy. <laughs> That's what happens. You want to get all up in somebody's shit all the time. It's none of your business why they decided to put the easement on lot number two versus lot number one. Here's what's your business. You're now selling lot number two. What do you think a buyer of lot number two should know before they purchase it? And that's the lot number one so uses their driveway. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whoever owns lot number one has the right to do what with your driveway? Use it. Use it. Use it. Use it. That's what you need to know. And that's what you're going to be tested on. That's what is important to us. So remember, um, I'm going to answer Brian's question here. Remember, they just have permission to use it. They do not own it. So hopefully that will answer your question. If they want to put something on that driveway, like a basketball hoop or something, they don't own that driveway. They just have permission to use the driveway. Would they need permission to put a basketball hoop on it? Yes, they would, because they do not own it. Okay. All right. So Leslie, somebody... I want you to start talking about an easement and gross. I'm going to turn my camera off for just a second because I need a prop. Somebody sent me a private message and I need a prop to answer that. But I want you to start talking about easements oh, and gross while I grab it, okay? Getting excited about this. Yes, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> remember, so when we were talking about a permanent easement, how many pieces of land were we talking about? Two. Two. We have two pieces of land. One of the differences about that and the easement in gross is how many pieces of land are affected, are involved in this situation. That's why we focused so much earlier to make sure that you knew we were talking about two different types of easements, two different properties being involved on in an, in an pertinent easement. When it comes to an easement in gross, it's the same thing. It is the right to use, right? They're not, they don't own that property. It is the right to use a piece of land or a portion of a piece of land by either an individual or by a company. So it is the right to use a piece of land or a portion of a piece of land by an individual or a company it is still going to affect one piece of land, not two in this case. So remember, Travis, earlier we were mentioning we wanted to make sure they understood that a, an appurtenant easement was affecting two pieces of land because in this case, it is only going to affect one. So only one property is being affected in this. We have two people or maybe uh, two companies, but we still have one uh, 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 property being affected in this case. That's exactly right. So you still have an easement that's being created. But in this case, the easement is not there to benefit one piece of property. Like in our previous slide, like in our previous picture, you don't have the easement sitting there and, and you can't say, okay, well, this easement benefits the dominant property. The easement is located on the servant property because in the case of an easement in gross, you're only looking at how many properties at one time, folks. One. 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 You're looking at a singular piece of property. And what you're saying is that there's an easement here. What does an easement always mean to the property owner? No matter what kind of easement we're talking about, I have to give somebody else what? Permission. Permission. Permanent right to access some part or use some part of my property. Isn't that always what an easement means? Yes. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. If the person that I'm giving, or the, if, if I'm giving the right to use my property to someone because they happen to own the property next door, that's an appurtenant easement. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again. If I'm buying a lot, like in this case, lot number two, and I look at the map of my lot and it says, here's an easement. And I say, well, what's this? And you say, well, you have to give somebody the right to use your driveway and your question is who who's got the right to use my driveway and the if the answer is 
whoever happens to own the property next door, not just the owner right now, but whoever happens to own the property next door. How many properties are we talking about, folks? Two. Two. That's an appurtenant easement. If you're looking at an easement and you look at your property that you're about to buy and there's an easement there and you say, now, wait a minute, I see this utility easement. Who do I have to give the right to access my property? If the answer is somebody else, not somebody who happens to own a property next door, but somebody else like Duke Power or okay. somebody else like the town of Cary or somebody else like Billy Bob, who you don't even know who may not even own any property, but Billy Bob has the right to use your property. That is an easement in gross. Here's the thing. The easement appurtenant or the appurtenant easement is the beneficiary going to change as ownership changes? In other words, right now, I might have to give Bob the right to use my driveway because Bob owns lot number one. But if Bob sells to Sarah, who do I have to give the right to use my driveway? Sarah. 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 And if Sarah sells to Seth, who do I have to give the right to use my driveway? Seth. 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 The land. And the reason is it's not Bob or Sarah or Seth who has the right to use my driveway. It's whoever happens to be the owner of lot number one. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Yep. This yes. is property. But with your when you're looking at an easement in gross and you look at it here and it says Duke Power, who will always have that easement no matter what happens with the real estate that duke, duke, power. duke power does that make sense for everybody because duke power's ability to use it is not based on them owning land duke power's ability to use it is based on them being duke power and the same thing is true back here what if this said this easement back here said bob who has the right to use that easement back there? Bob. Bob. What if the properties get what if the property gets sold? Who still has the right to use it? Bob. 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 Is there anything Bob can do to lose that right to that easement? You can give it up. Die. 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 That's oh, yeah. it. He can yeah. die. That's oh, the earlier. difference you between the two of them. Because here's the thing. It's always murder. This one never goes away nope. because even if Seth dies, isn't there going to be a new owner of that property? Yes. 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 And the new owner is going to just take over the right. But if yep. you look at this easement, if Duke Power goes out of business, what happens to the easement that Duke Power has? It goes away. It goes away. It goes away. If Bob dies, what happens to the easement that Bob has? Bye-bye. Bye. Die. And so I mean, this, this is another one of those times where Seth came up with something in a previous class that I think is really helpful. Death is gross. Only one type of easement goes away at death. An easement in what? Gross. 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 An easement in gross. <laughs> a pertinent easements never go away, right? But easements in gross go away when the beneficiary dies. When the beneficiary, if the beneficiary is a company, when the company goes out of business. Even Duke Power. Will Duke Power eventually go out of business? I hope yes. so. Yes. Eventually. Did I say that out loud? Of course they will. We, we will probably all be dead and gone, but they will. Okay, Most I had no team. idea. We're Side note, get. because we need these in this class. I just didn't realize that there was such thing as public power. What do you mean you didn't realize there was such thing as public power? They just came from the fairies. They just deliver power to your house. What do you, what, what do you no, mean? No, I think I think in in California there's public power. There are some publicly owned utilities, but most of oh, them. Well, they're the government. You mean? Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. government mm -hmm. owned. Gotcha. Yeah, there are some publicly, <laughs> but most of them are are private. Like a co-op, you mean? Like a co-op. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, I just was. I'm just so used to private. You know, yeah. in North Carolina. Sure. Now, easements matter tremendously to the holder of the easement. Now, I'm going to stop my share for just a second because I want to answer that private question that somebody sent to me or comment. Somebody, somebody sent a comment said, 
I, I just, appurtenances, easements, liens, encumbrances, they all seem like the same thing. Why do they have so many different names? They all seem like the same thing. Because you're not thinking of, of them in a progression. They are all the same thing. So I went to get props. Because sometimes when you can take it away from real estate, I think it makes more sense. What are these? You know, shoes. Shoes. This is just Travis's opportunity to show off his collection. Are right. they, no, it's not. I grabbed it was the first three pairs of shoes I grabbed. Okay. <laughs> are these all the same type of shoe? No. 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 <laughs> no. But they are all what? Shoes. 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 This is what? This one right here. Tennis shoe. This is a tennis <laughs> shoe or a sneaker, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. This is a what? Flip flop. Yes. Which, if you look carefully, has been appropriately chewed by an animal at some <laughs> point. And uh, these are my these are my go get in the hot tub flip flops. And he likes to gnaw on them because he gets mad that I'm in the hot tub. So See, uh, it's a chance to brag about the shoes and the hot tub. No, no. And what kind of shoe is it? And what kind of shoe is this? Slipper. Um, like a moccasin loafer or whatever, you know, whatever we want to call it. Topsider. Okay. Top sider. There you go. Barbara wants to know where your crocs are. But they I don't have any crocs. I don't own those. Um, but they are all still what? Shoes. Shoes. Appurtenances, folks. <laughs> Appurtenances. They're all restrictions. They're all one big category, like shoes. Here's the thing. Water rights. Water rights are a type of appurtenance, a specific kind. They're still an appurtenance. They're just, if you were describing these, would you say, oh, those are shoes? Or would you say those are sneakers? What would you say? Sneakers. 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 But aren't they still shoes? Yes. yes. Yeah. So water rights are appurtenances still because that's the main category they fall under but they're a specific type of appurtenance does that make sense for everybody yeah. yes encumbrances is it still a shoe yep yes 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 but if you were trying to describe it would you just say and uh, that's not i don't know what that is i think that's a chew mark um uh, <laughs> it, it is a chew mark at the back um and so it's a type of shoe. Would you say that it's a shoe or would you say, oh, it's a slide? It's a flip-flop. What would you say? It's a flip-flop. You would give the more definitive answer. So when somebody asks, you know, oh, well, appurtenances and liens and encumbrances, it all sounds like the same thing. Is it all the same thing to an extent, folks? Yes. Yes, yeah. yes because they're all what? Appurtenances. Oh, they're all shoes. They all fall under that main category. But what we're doing now is we're taking different types of shoes and giving you more detail about those specific kinds. So right now, when we talk about easements, are we still talking about shoes? Yes. 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 But we're just talking about a very specific type of shoe. Does that make sense for everybody? Yep. Yes. And even once you get down to the specific type of shoe, let's say. Here's your easements. It even gets more specific than that. There's a left shoe and a right shoe, right? Yes. So a pertinent easement, easement and gross, two different types of easements, left shoe, right shoe. It's just getting more and more descriptive. Does that help with the whole idea of what we're doing? They are all similar. They are all the same. We're just getting more and more detailed as we go. I think it's a genius idea. I like it. It just helps you guys kind of separate it from real estate because as you said earlier, sometimes we do get, you know, too far into it and real estate can be a new thing for you. So it might make it harder for you to understand. So we want to relate it to you and everybody knows shoes. Everybody knows different kinds of shoes. So that helps kind of picture it in right. a different way. Right. Compartmentalizing doesn't work because what we're doing is we're just diving deeper and deeper and deeper into the same things. We're going deeper layers of detail, right? 
So take out your phone. I want you, I want you to think about this one. It says Zara has the right to travel across a neighbor's property to access a pond located there. What kind of easement is this? Now, I want you to think before you answer it. Is it Zara's property that gives her the right to travel across the neighbor? Or is it Zara herself who has the right? Because that is going to really determine your answer. Okay. Give you a couple minutes to get in there. It's the same text message thread. And if you need to get back in there, remember you're sending the text to 22333. If you need to re-enroll, it's Travis Everett 302. Also remember, how many pieces of land are we talking about? How many lots are we talking about? That might help you. Seems to be a little bit of a debate. <laughs> right, row. Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's why we have to talk about it. Well, we're doing this. And again, what you're thinking about here is, is it Zara herself who has that right? Or is it Zara's property that has that right? That's going to be the difference. Okay. We understand there's a property that's being taken advantage of. That's always the case in an easement. What we want to know is, is a person or company doing the taking advantage or is another lot doing the taking advantage? So let's talk about this one. Maybe let me restate it and see if I can, let me show you what would change the answer and then you tell me which one it, which one it should have been. How about if it said, Zara owns a lot that, gives her the right. Mm. What would the answer be then? If it said Zara owns a lot that gives her the right. That's an appurtenance. That would be an appurtenant easement. Did it say that though? Did it say Zara owns a lot that gives her the right? Or did it simply say Zara has the right? Zara has the right. Zara. And if it's specifically Zara that has the right, folks, this is an easement in gross. Does that make sense for everybody? Because, you know, in this case, it's a person or a company benefiting from this. So we're talking about Zara. And here's what we know about that. If that's an easement in gross, will it go away at some point in the future? Yes. Yes, when she dies. When Zara dies. Um. And does it help if it says across? Because it's across, it's not adjacent. Well, it, if that helps you, but just be sure that you, what you're paying attention to is, does it mention that Zara has this right specifically related to her owning the land? Right. If not, then it's an easement in gross. If so, then it's an appurtenant easement. Okay. In this case, the only, the only, thing we know is that Zara has the right. So if you see on the test, Duke Power has the right to access um, my property to maintain the power lines that go over my property. Easement and gross or a pertinent easement? Easement and gross. Easement and gross. Kim owns a parcel of land which grants her the right to access a shared driveway on a neighboring parcel of land. A pertinent easement. 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 How do we feel? Can you tell the difference yeah. between them? Yep. Okay. Yep. There you go. <laughs> That's the difference. Would this one go away when the neighbor dies? So no, this one would not go away when the neighbor dies. It doesn't have anything to do with who owns the land. Easements and gross don't relate to who owns the land. As long as Zara is alive, then whoever owns that land has to give Zara this right. This easement will last until what happens? Zara yeah, dies. dies. Until Zara dies. Duke Power has an easement over my land. It will last until what happens? They Duke's a company. company. Until Duke ceases to exist as a company. Those are easements and gross. Good luck. Those are what easements. About, and gross. What about if Duke gets consumed by another entity? 
that's not dying. If Duke is purchased by another entity, that new entity takes over everything that Duke owned, including their easements. Those easements are um, assets of Duke Energy. So as an example, Duke Power is actually a really good example of that. Some of yep. you who have lived in North Carolina for a very long time will remember a company called Carolina Power and Light, CPNL. CPNL. I remember them. The, and so CPNL was the major energy provider in the triangle for decades. Mm -hmm. CPNL was purchased by a company called Progress Energy. So what happened to all of the easements that CPNL had for land where their power lines went across? It Progress Energy has them. It transferred to Progress Energy. Fast forward another decade, Progress Energy no longer exists because it has been consumed by what? Duke. Duke Energy or Duke Power. I think it's Duke Power now, right? Isn't it? Or is it Duke Energy? I can't remember which it is. What it, I Duke them every Power. month. You think I should know, right? Right. Energy right. Progress. Energy. right. Yeah. Well, for a while, they called themselves Duke Progress, and then they just dropped the progress part out. So That's now all... Energy Progress. That's their name. So here's the thing. Here's how that would work. If you were selling a property and the deed makes a reference to an easement belonging to Carolina Power and Light... Is that an easement that still has to be followed? Yes. 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 Because you just know now that the company that eventually became Duke Power is the same thing as Carolina Power and Light. And so it takes some research sometimes to figure out with these easements and growth who actually has the current right. Now, I'm going to back up to this picture for just a second because I want to be clear about this. This is something you need to be aware of as a real estate broker. If Duke Power has this easement. So I'm going to, I'm going to take Bob off the back of this property here. And actually, why don't we do this? Let, let's make it a, a, a realistic thing. Let's say across the back of this property, there is an easement for um, public service of North Carolina, which provides natural gas. So there are gas lines running across the back of the property. Mm -hmm. If there's a gas leak, does public service of North Carolina have the right to come on to that portion of this land and dig up that pipe and repair it as needed? Yes. 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 So what if the homeowner, because this is often a question, what if the homeowner has put a fence up mm. just inside their property line all the way around? They'll tear it down. <laughs> They'll tear it down and charge you. That's exactly <laughs> right. If you don't, if you block public service of North Carolina from getting access to their easement, they have every legal right to tear down the fence that's in their way. And by the way, they can charge you for the time it takes them to cut your fence down. They can bill they, you for the labor. And they and, won't put it back up. And they and, won't put it back up. And they added to their utility. Right. And, 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 and they listen, they could actually charge you for the extra downtime of not being able to provide gas to those people. If it took them an extra hour to cut your fence down Ooh. and they lost and they lost fifty thousand dollars in gas sales because of not being able to provide gas, they could charge you for that. And that's okay. why it's so important yeah. to know that these easements exist and they cannot be impeded. Exactly. I'm going to charge them for the power surge that they caused to my house and the AC that I had to pay for. Unfortunately, you don't have that legal right. They do. You know what? So, <laughs> Travis, if they come in and dig that up and it just looks bad, right? Yeah. That's Are they required to fix it back? The no, way it was? not unless the easement specifies exactly what they have to do. They're not required to do anything. Now, most of the time they will because they don't they don't want to create a lot of bad will in the community, but they're not required to. They could leave it dug up for all we I mean, for all intents and purposes. <clears throat> Remember, they they have access to that. Somehow they were given that access. Well, they purchased them, were given to them, whatever the case, so they had access let, to that. Let me ask y'all, let me, let me uh, ask y'all a question. Here's the thing, because we want to focus on how this is not fair. Unfortunately, as much as we don't like it, it is fair. Who gave Duke Power the right to access their property on the day they decided to buy this property? 
Owner. And the current owner did. If they didn't want to agree to that, what was their choice? Not to buy the oh. house. I don't buy this property. That's always the choice. The problem is we don't like living with the repercussions of our choices in that regard. We, these are the trade-offs we make. Because here's the truth. I don't want to buy a house that doesn't have power. Well, guess what? To have power, guess what you're going to have across your property? An easement. An easement. If you want to have no easements, you can buy something in the middle of Montana somewhere and live off the grid and have solar power and no internet and whatever. But that's, you know, but that's the thing. You got the fleas come with the dog, right? They do. They really do. Who do you think probably gave Duke Power this easement in the in the beginning? The builder. The builder the did. Builder. Yes. But when the developer was developing this neighborhood and building these properties out to be sold. They needed power and Duke Power came in and said, you know what, we'll be glad to go and bury these power lines, but you got to give us an easement across every single one of these lots so that if we ever need to come back in here to maintain these. Well, isn't the developer going to be all for that at that point in time because they need to get power to these houses that they're building? Yeah, otherwise yeah. how are they going to be able to do that? And then once it's created, who has to honor those easements? All the, the owners. 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 All the subsequent the owners. Future owners. Christina, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so my father and I own some land and we literally got uh, approached about this because they're building a subdivision next to our land and they needed a sanitary sewer easement. Yep. And they paid us. <laughs> the funny thing is, is it was kind of confusing to me because what got recorded was just an option uh, because I guess they don't even know if they can do the subdivision yet. Sure. Yep. Right. Uh, so I guess I was confused because I was like, okay, so why did they they paid for the option, I guess, because they don't want to end up not having that. And then they have the subdivision. Exactly. Coming. Well, what they don't want to do is they don't want, I, I can tell you, it's not going to matter for your purposes. They don't want to pay for the survey because they would have to have a survey done of all that land to draw the easement in place. And surveys like that cost thousands of dollars, if not tens of thousands of dollars. So until they find out for sure that they can move forward with the development, they don't want to invest the money in the survey. Hmm. Oh, that's okay. what it is. That's I just thought, it because I mean, within months we had money, but they don't have an easement just yet, correct? Right. Yeah. What they have is the what they have is the right to place an easement if needed. Exactly. Ne exactly. Because you gave them that right. Right. Um, and so Jay said, are overhead power lines considered an easement? Yes, in two ways. Number one, air rights. Don't we own the right to the air above our land, folks? Yes. So if those power lines are going to traverse across our property, they are trespassing unless they have a what? Easement. An easement. easement. And perhaps equally importantly, isn't there also going to be the need for an easement in case of need to maintain those power lines? If they need to bring vehicles on the property underneath those power lines in order to maintain them, if the line breaks, if they need to replace it, any of those things. So there, there's definitely need for an easement underneath any overhead power lines. For sure. Okay, so easements are a very specific type of uh, encumbrance that limits the use of the property. I don't expect you to see a test question about the creation of easements. Just know that easements are usually created voluntarily by the owners of the property agreeing to, just like Christina was just making reference to. Somebody came to him and said, hey, we need an easement across your property. We'll pay you for it. And Christina's like, sure, whatever, you know? So, uh, so in that case, Travis, would Christina's, uh, eat, uh, whatever she agreed on, would that be recorded? It, once it's created to create the easement, yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Because otherwise, if it's not recorded, it's not what? Permanent. It's not permanent. It's not enforceable in a court of law. So to make it permanent, it would need to be recorded. So what Some, did they pay her for? Just the, to get on the land and survey they, it? Or they whatever? paid her for the right to place an easement if they deem one necessary. So in all, if for all intents and purposes, Christina has to treat it as if the easement is there. Already exists. She, she has to because she knows and she agreed that they had the right to place the easement there. But future owners will not have to honor that unless this company does what with that easement that they've just agreed to with Christina? They record it. 
And it's, in a, it's in a buffer, so I couldn't build there anyway. So for me, it was kind of a good decision. It I made guess. sense for you. There you go. Well, so if they decide not to do the easement, do you have to give the money by? No. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this, is, this is a developer just being proactive and making sure that if they ever have the need to put the easement that it's going to be there, as Christine said, they don't want to go ahead and develop. Let me, let me tell you what just happened. Find that afterwards. This is okay. a developer who doesn't want to be held hostage by Christina down the road. Because there here's what would happen. <laughs> if the developer moved full steam ahead, knowing that they would need this easement down the road if everything else got approved, and they spent $150,000 on all the other approvals and now they come back to christina and say we're fully approved for a subdivision but we need an easement across your property did the easement just become more expensive folks really yes. more expensive absolutely <laughs> really, really, really nice to very right. nice. Right. Charles, what if christina moves then what happens to that if what it if hasn't been recorded well then that's they're taking that risk again you're too damn nosy Right. That's, that's <laughs> right now. It's only between Christina and that developer because right. they have not done what with it, folks. Built it or it. used it. They it's haven't recorded. recorded the easement. Oh, recorded. That developer is taking a risk as long as they leave that easement unrecorded. My guess is they will move forward and record the easement. But if they don't, then it, there is no easement because. It, ha it Right now, it's just an agreement to create one. Christina has simply given them the right to create an easement. If they do, great. If they don't, even better. She's already gotten paid for giving them the right to create one. Doesn't mean it's actually been created yet. That's it. That's all that's happened. Okay. So how do easements get terminated? Only two ways. Easements and gross terminate when what happens? They, they die. When no, the easement the holder, holder dies. dies. Not no. when the property owner dies, but when the easement holder dies. A prudent easements don't have that out. Land continues. The only other way an easement can get terminated is if a court of law steps in. If a court of law says this easement is no longer an easement. That's it. Even if the easement beneficiary says, you know what, we don't want this easement anymore, it still exists until who declares that it doesn't exist? Court of law. A court. Easements are designed to be permanent, folks. You don't get rid of permanent things that are attached to land without a court of law taking action. You just don't. You remember, owners of land have the right to add restrictions to their land, but they do not have the right to do what? Take them away. You can always add Perfect. restrictions, but you can't do what, folks? Take them out. Take, take, them, away. Away. take, take them away. Here's how I can see it. You can only make it sheer for the next one, but you can't make it better for can't it. Can't make it better. <laughs> Removing an easement would be making it better. You can't do that on your own. You need a court of law to do that. Mm hmm now, of course, if both parties are in agreement and go to a court of law, they're probably going to take it. They're going to get rid of the easement, but you have to wait for the court to do it. It's just the way it works. They're meant to be permanent. So I've shown you right here in this picture an example of something called a plat map. That's vocabulary you're going to need to know. We're going to talk about it. Uh, several more times throughout the class, but this entire picture, if you see right here, and it's spelled P-L-A-T, plat. Plat. P-L-A-T. This is a plat map, not a plot map, a plat map. This is called a plat. A plat is a drawing of a subdivision. A subdivision is any division of land. Here's what you need to understand about this map. Prior to this map being drawn and recorded, I'm going to highlight something for you here on this thing. Prior to this map being drawn and recorded, this block of land right here 
was how many lots, folks, prior to this map being recorded, how one. many lots was that? One. Just one. It was one, one lot. And the act of recording this map is the owner of that one lot saying, I don't want my land to be one big piece of land anymore. I want to what? What's the word there? Subdivide. I want to subdivide it into smaller pieces. Now, if you only wanted to cut it into two pieces, would it still be a subdivision? Yes. 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 Anytime you're taking a big piece of land and you are chopping it up into smaller pieces, you are creating a subdivision. Now, this one specifically is phase two of section five of McDonald Woods. Is that, your is, that is. This is actually this is actually my this is actually my plat map. Uh, or my street, it's uh, uh, you can't really see my lot. Well, you can it's further actually. down over there, right? Yeah, it's it was further up. My this lot right here, the corner this, of it. Yeah, that's what I thought that was yours. Yeah, yeah, the the blue one right there. That's actually my my lot right there. Mm -hmm. But there's a reason I've shown you this section of this plat map. Um, and if you'll notice, this is a plat map that was, when was this subdivided? When were these lots created? 1979. 27 of 1979 is when this big piece of land became these smaller pieces of land. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. Okay. So in 1979, somebody who owned this piece of land decided that they wanted to subdivide it into a bunch of smaller pieces of land. And then what did they probably do after they subdivided it? Built what on them? Homes. Houses. 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 And then they individually sold the homes and land as individual lots. That's the That's development the process. Right there. Okay. So this is what developers do. Is everybody good with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you can you repeat the, uh, the, the definition of plat map? A plat map is simply a map, a drawing of a subdivision. It is a drawing of here was one big piece of property and now we are putting property lines in it to make it more than one smaller piece of property. So a plat map may only show two lots. Plat map may show 200 lots. It's whatever number of lots that this piece of land is being broken into. Are everybody okay with that as far as the definition goes? Mm -hmm. and, and look at Luis. Luis said, I see a utility easement. Exactly. This is why I brought this up. This is where you would go to look to find folks. People always say, well, where do I find these things like easements? Look at this plat map, which was created all the way back in when, folks? 79. 1979. Does it show the easements that were created all the way back in 1979? Yes. Yeah. It does. Now, here's what I want to point out to you. I'm going to zoom back out for a second. Right here in is US Highway 1 and 64, which is still there and is larger now, as a matter of fact. But that's US Highway 1 and 64 running through. I'm going to change my highlight color here for to green. Everything back here is part of the Cary Greenway system. This is all the Cary Greenway. There's a park over here, McDonald Woods Park, and this is all the Cary Greenway system. Okay, everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Now, if you will notice, and here's where I want to focus in right now. I want to look at lot number 158, which is right here. And lot number 157, which is right here. Right there between those two lots. And it's easier to see it on this thing. Let me, let me see if I can draw this. 
right here. Everybody see, see uh oh, it went away. Everybody see this, this area right here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. You see where that's labeled as a pedestrian ingress, egress easement right there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Folks, that is an easement that was created all the way back in 1979 to allow people access to the Cary Greenway system. Everybody with oh. me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. It's between, yeah. does everybody see that it is between those two houses? Yeah. Yes. Here's what I want you to understand. It's never been used up to this point. There is nothing there between those two houses. It's simply not there. But is the easement still there? Yep. Yes. 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 Guess what the town of Cary has now decided they want to do? But they want to that easement. They're going to right. put a, they're going to put a concrete walkway right there that connects Heidinger Drive to the town of Cary's Greenway system. They're gonna put a sign up right here that says Greenway access. And Have they're you gonna, seen those lots? And they're gonna pave all the way through here access back to the Greenway system. Are those oh, people God. and are those people going to have people walking very close to the end of their houses now, walking mm -hmm. their dogs, riding their bikes, accessing their the greenway system? Yes. Yes. Yes, they are. And here's the thing. They should have known that when they bought those houses, when they bought those lots, because that easement even though it was not being utilized, was always what, folks? There. 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 It was always there. There was always the risk that the town of Cary was going to come in and utilize that easement, which is exactly what they are doing right now. Yeah. I, I mean, this would be something we would probably have to research as a broker. Absolutely. It, so again, when you start looking down the road and saying, why do people hire us for our services? This is the kind of expertise they're looking for. This is well, why. They need someone to tell them, hey, you're going to have dog poop all over your, your, your yard here because you're going to have hundreds of people walking back and forth on a daily basis. So they don't have some clients. That's exactly right. Okay. So this is, so where do you find, I love that question, Josh, but you need to make the connection, Josh. Where do you always find these kinds of things that mm -hmm. relate to property? In the public the county the court. Recorded at the courthouse. Recorded at the county courthouse. Folks, where is this map available? Online. Yes. Of course. At I mean, the Register of, of Deeds for, for office for at the Wake County Courthouse. It As says a matter right at the bottom, it a matter of recorded, fact, what does it say right there? Yeah, it says recorded in Book of Maps, 1979, page 764. And to this day, folks, could you go to the Register of Deeds office, either online or in person in Wake County, North Carolina, and say, I want to see page 764 of the Book of Maps not number 1979 and would you find yeah. this map publicly available 24 hours a day right now today yes. Yes. I promise you which is why to be um familiar with this kind of stuff and i don't think it's our job to necessarily give legal advice on it but just to make them aware absolutely what is um, the easement saw... just north of there oh i think it's the same one um, there is a there is a drainage easement um, and a separate pedestrian easement up further, so they could come in and use this one as well, right here. They one, want yeah, right. either one. Okay. But but I think the 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 town decided to use the first one. Well, right, but they could they could certainly make the decision later to come back and use both if they decided yep. to. Yep, That's exactly did. right. So uh, the question was, what type of easement would this be then, Katie? Great question. 
Does this easement benefit the neighboring property or does this benefit, does this easement benefit somebody outside of the prop of the ownership of the property? Outside. 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 So what kind of easement is this? Is this an easement in gross or is this an appurtenant easement? In gross. Um, uh, easement in this gross. is an easement in gross. That's exactly right. This is an easy. I saw interest. that Wayne had a question. It said, um, what kind of legal recourse does the homeowners have? None. I think they None. should have adverse possession. because They agreed to this when they bought the property. They agreed to this when they bought the property and they and they took ownership of the property, folks. They agreed to this. So yeah. they can legally just let it happen. <laughs> they, this, this, I mean, nobody forced this upon these people. They agreed to this. They bought that property. They, whether they knew or not, the answer the court would give them is, you should have known. You should have known. It's always up to a buyer to know what they're purchasing. Always. You have a question, Katie? Um, so if the city decides never to build it, even though it's on the plat map, people technically can still walk through there because if they never built the sidewalk. Bingo, Katie. Does the public still have the easement even if the town never actually pours the walkway? Yes. Wow. Right. So technically, you can go walk through there right now. You can go walk through there right now and you will not be trespassing because the easement has always existed. Okay. Okay. And so it's definitely, this is something that people who are purchasing property need to be aware of because it will definitely impact them. Now, there are other types of encumbrances that we run into that easements can help fix called encroachments. So one encroachments quick thing, remember at the beginning of this section, we were saying like, there's going to be several types of easements. We, I mean, encumbrances, we just went over the first one now kind of going into number two. Right. An encroachment is also a type of encumbrance. It's a limitation. An encroachment is when somebody didn't bother to figure out where the property lines were. I like to see this as an accidental issue. Something happened by mistake. Something this is a big mistake. This is somebody who spent money building stuff on land that they don't what, folks? Oh. 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 If you look at this picture, assuming these white lines are the property lines, is there a problem with this portion of this fence and pool and a hot tub right here? Is there a problem here? Yes, it's not on the Encroachment. This is an encroachment. That pool, so if we were to label these lots with numbers, let's say this is lot number 127 and this is lot number 145, would it be fair to say that lot number 127 is encroaching on lot number 145? Yes. Right? Yeah. Encroachment is when you don't stay in your natural boundaries. This is the encroachment. It crosses over the property lines. Well, there's one obvious fix for this. Could the owner of lot number 145 say, you got to tear down this pool because it encroaches on my property. Could they do, could they do that? Yes. yes. For sure. That's their legal right. It's their property. Or say, let me use it. Uh, or they could come <laughs> to an agreement and say, let me use the pool if they want to. What is the legal permanent fix for this other than moving the property lines. Of course, we could re, but moving property lines is much more involved than creating one other thing that would provide relief here. What legal tool is perfectly suited to provide relief to this? Remember, we're trying to find a solution for the future as well. Okay. Right. What would future proof this so that you would not have a problem selling e selling this property in the future so that that the pool could legally stay there forever without any concern? That 27 could buy that. Property. And well, they could buy mm -hmm. that property, but again, that's a, that's too involved. There's an easier solution. There's a, a solution easement. and easement would go. solve this problem. Legal permission, permanent. Could we not 
try to convince the owner of lot number 145 to give an easement for this portion of their lot. Could we do that? Yes. And would this be an easement in gross or would this be an appurtenant easement? Would, would the easement belong to Sarah who owns the house at lot number 127 or would the easement belong to lot number 127 itself? Apartment. It's apartment. The easement would belong to lot number 127 itself. And Louise, most likely, lot number 127 would have to pay lot 145 to create this easement. Why else would they? If you come, if you come to lot 145 and say, listen, by accident, we built half my pool on your yard, lot 145 is like, we'll tear it down. And lot 127 is like, well, I don't want to do that. Can't we come to some agreement? And 127 would be servient, right? Mm -hmm. No, 127 no. would not be servient. Again, you're kidding. focusing on the creation of the easement. Stop it. Focus on once the easement exists, which lot is doing the work on behalf of the other lot. Once this easement would be created, which lot would be working for the other lot? Which one would be taking advantage be taken advantage of? 145 would be servient and 127 would be dominant. 145 would be servient, 127 would be dominant. And a couple of you are focused on whether or not 145 has access to the pool. That depends on how the what is actually created, folks. Easement. How the easement is actually created. Maybe they agree to a less amount. That's, for, up, that. that's for them to they agree, are. right? We don't care about that. We don't care. We care about it if we're selling one of those properties, but we would look specifically at the what? Deed. Easement. At the deed where the, the easement, easement was and see what it says. And also recommend to that buyer they talk to who? An attorney. An attorney. An attorney because they need a really clear Advice. sort of translation of this is exactly what your rights would be. This is exactly what would happen. But this, this could be fixed with an appurtenant easement. Here's the thing you need to understand about an encroachment. This is really bad. Okay. Right now, neither one of these properties can effectively be sold. Once we realize this problem exists, you're not going to be able to sell number lot, lot number 127. Why? Because anybody buying lot 127 is going to want to know if they have to do what with their pool? Uh, tear it down. It tear it down. You're not going to be able to sell them one, not lot number 145 because anybody buying lot number 145 is not going to know, what the hell do I do with this pool that's on my land? They probably can't either because they can't get a loan. Right. You're going to be all kinds of problems with both of these properties. I mean, could 145 say, I'm going to tear down the pool? Sure they could. It's on their land. Right. That's nothing. <laughs> and that's the great unknown, and that's the problem with an encroachment. And that's why you write up an easement. And that's why you would, the better solution is for these two parties to come to a agreement with each other and create this easement. Jay, again, you're going too far. It's not for us to figure out all these other legal ramifications and these other legal options. That's not our role. Our role is to understand what's the most obvious way to fix this issue as it is in front of us. And what's the most obvious, straightforward way to fix this issue right now once we've found it? A pertinent easement. And a pertinent easement. And a pertinent and there's always murder. <laughs> exactly. Well, in this case, I don't know about that because it's the it's, it stays with the property, but you but it, know, true. it doesn't have to be a pool. Would a fence cutting over onto somebody else's property be an encroachment? Oh, yeah. So yeah. my neighbors, my neighbors planted trees on the neighbor's property, thinking it was theirs, and they wanted to have some sort of a division. Well, they just gave the neighbors some trees. <laughs> well, and which the neighbors may not want, so they may rip them out. Yeah. You know, that, and, that, and, that's, and that's just it. They created an encroachment. Any and so that, here's, the, here's the moral of that story. Before you make any improvement on your property, what do you need to know where they are located exactly? Not guessing. 
property lines. The property lines. And folks, there is only one way to know where the property lines are located. There is a professional service that you can obtain whose job it is to locate property lines. What is the name of that service? Survey. 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 So what if they ask you on a test, what's the primary purpose of a survey? It is to establish the lot lines and look for what? Encroachments. 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 To make sure that nothing crosses that property line. Nothing has been stolen or used illegally. Exactly. Exactly. Stay in your lane, neighbor. Stay in your lane. That's a great point, all right? And your lane and hope the garden tool. So let's, why don't we do this? Let's take a, a break for- I think Katie uh, has a question, Travis. Oh, Katie, let me question. get Katie's question and then we'll take a break. Oh, okay, I, Katie. I'm sorry, I'm, maybe I'm just not understanding. I'm, so if 127 gets an appurtenant easement for 145, what? I heard what one. essentially does that do for 145? It just protects him if he wants to sell his property? It doesn't do anything for 145. It's bad for 145. Bad. Okay. Which is why they're probably going to want what in order to create it? What, what do you always Money. want? There you go. You're going to have to pay them because you're making my property shittier with your stupid okay. easement. Okay. Yeah. So now 145, it's going to have an issue because if they try to sell it, you don't think they're going to have to tell the next buyer, hey, by the way, you got to give one. Let, me, let me tell you how that conversation is going to go. Um, I just found out that my pool is halfway on your property. Yeah, I've been meaning to tell you that. They didn't know. But they're going to act like they knew. And they didn't care before they knew. But they care now because guess what? They just, guess what's flicking behind their eyes? So y'all don't, don't know humanity yet. What's flicking Hello, behind their eye? Cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. How much did it cost to put that pool in the ground? Mm-hmm. $100,000. At least $100,000, if not $150,000 invested right there. How much Ooh. is lot number 145 going to want for this easement, folks? Hmm, let me thank you for just a minute. $150,000. $150, They're going to want a hundred grand or more for this easement. <laughs> Because they down? know if they say no, it's going to cost at least that much for this person to do what with their pool? Get rid of it. Get rid of it, rid of it and move it. So if 145 doesn't care, though, like let's say they don't care and then they want to sell it to somebody, they don't have to actually um, disclose that, right? Because you technically don't have to disclose it's not about who, sellers to disclose. Who's going to find out if they're smart, though, when they buy the, the one, lot 145? Well, that buyer's going to find oh. out. The buyer's going to find out because a smart buyer would have what survey. service done before survey. they bought survey. Survey. a survey. Yeah. Okay. And that's when you run into the problem. Oh, it's going to come out eventually. Trust me. Share what's your question. They're going to know. So if they establish, they agree to an easement between the two properties, is 145 liable for any injuries in the pool? Again, you're trying to be too damn nosy, Cher. And I have to, and I don't mean that in an ugly way, but y'all are trying to answer questions that only exist between those two parties. We don't know. Our job is not to be the referee for the world. Y'all can't even figure out what you want for breakfast and you want to fix everybody's problems on the face of the planet. Our job is to know that an easement exists. What would determine whether or not Lot 145 was responsible is how that easement was written. Would we need to look at the specifics of that easement between those two properties? Yep. So there, in other words, Cher, there's no one size fits all. All we know is that somebody's using somebody else's land illegally and we got to fix that problem. How right. it's fixed by, by giving them permission. What are the conditions of the permission? So who would they need to consult to create an easement that protected all of their interest and made sure that they didn't get sued or there wasn't these liability issues in the creation of the easement for down the road? So, these, so it does really solve all the problems. Hint, not us, real estate agents. Not us, attorneys. Attorney. This attorney. is attorney time, folks. It's our job. Here's what our job is to go easement and somebody says what does that mean talk to your attorney there's our job that's all your basic understanding needs to be 
See, all this beyond, 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 beyond stuff is what? That's why people think this class is hard. If people only learned what they really need to learn in this class, the class would be a lot easier. Yep. You start so chasing that comes those. Later. That's why law school takes eight years. Because and that's where you learn that all the infinite details. Of, you know how long they spend on easements in law school? Oof. Weeks just on easements. We can't do that. And we don't need to do that, thankful. Yeah, so our job is just to let them know, hey, there's a problem here. You figure it out. That's right. There's you an encroachment. Out. The best way to fix that is with an easement. Let's go talk to who? Attorney. attorney. An attorney. That's there we go. Right. That's the extent hell, of our knowledge. Hell, sometimes it's not even our job to tell them there's a there's an encroachment. It's our job to tell them to see if there is an encroachment. That's exactly right. It's our job to say, hey, you should have a survey done to see if there are encroachments. And right. then when the survey comes back and it says, yes, there are encroachments, it's like, this is a problem. We need to go talk to an attorney talk about to your this. Attorney. Trust so, me, our job is easier than what it sounds like. <laughs> so I have a question, though. Um, so after the fact that two already established that there is an encroachment and they pay, so do they have to create another deed for the future buyer to um, let them know about the, you know? Where's the, the only, you, you, I'm going to make you answer your own question, Christina. Where's the only place we can add restrictions to a property? On a what? A deed. <laughs> so do we need to create a new deed that it makes mention of this easement? Yes. For which property? For both properties. Bingo! Because it's what kind of an easement? Uh, it's a pertinent. So. And a pertinent easement. So does lot number 127 need a new deed recorded that makes reference to this easement? Yeah, so that was my question. So they need to create another deed, right? That's correct. Both, both properties property. need to be redeeded with mention okay. of the new easement and a new plat map needs to be recorded showing a picture of the what? The new property lines. Easement. Yes. So the property lines are not moving, but okay. it needs to show the easement. It doesn't need to show what's in the easement. We don't care that it's a pool, but it needs to show that the easement is now there. So the okay. future owners have to honor it. There How do they okay. go to honor that permission? See, what you have to do is fast forward 200 years and somebody's got to be able to say, that's what, what's going on here? Exactly. Like, that's that doesn't what... happen unless somebody takes all that information, puts it in writing, takes it where? To the Register of Deeds. The, the Register of Deeds at the county recorded. courthouse and does what with it? Record it. Yeah. Records record it. Record it. Now, everybody 200 years from now can see there's an easement. It, 200 years from now, is it still going to be a pool? Who knows? 20 years from now, it might be a bomb shelter there. But can once they have the easement, can they put anything they want to there? Yeah, because yes. they have permission yes. for it. Yes, because they have the permanent right to access that portion of that property. You always have to think about how could this affect this property in the future and fix it. That's or it. It's a, 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 a way that's already. So, been last question I'm going to ask you. Which lot wants this easement? Which lot needs this easement to be created? On 27. Which one is going to be taken advantage of in the creation of this easement? On 45. 45. Which lot becomes more valuable because the easement has been created? 127. 127. Which lot becomes less valuable? in the future 145. 145 which one is going to be dominant in the future as it relates to the easement 127 which one is going to be servient in the future related to this easement 145 there you go that's what you need to be able to do okay you can do that you've got a way better grasp of easements than 99 percent of the population does right there Okay. Including real estate brokers. And the other and the other one percent are attorneys. <laughs> and it's their job. Okay. All right. So let's take a break. I've got uh let's see, 1052. Why don't we come back at let's just say five past eleven? How about that? Okay, that's definitely your favorite place. Before we left off for the break, remember we're talking about encumbrances which are just a type of appurtenance. These are the bad appurtenances. And just a reminder, 
appurtenances or anything that's been attached to the property. There are good appurtenances. Don't mistake and think all appurtenances are bad, like the right to sell the property, the right to control the property, the right to occupy the property, all that bundle of rights that we talked about. Those are the good appurtenances that come mm -hmm. with real estate. Uh, the right to access water that is uh, uh, around the property or uh, adjoining the property. Those are, those are good appurtenances. But then the encumbrances are those negative ones. And the first type of encumbrance that we talked about was an easement. The second type of encumbrance we talked about was an encroachment. Another very common type of encumbrance that we're going to talk about in detail in a section all its own, we're just going to mention them here, is something called restrictive covenants or protective covenants, or they can be called deed restrictions. Sometimes they're even called like CCRs. You know, they all mean the same thing. These are rules that have been put in place by a previous owner of the property, but they have been put in place as an appurtenance, meaning those rules are gonna be attached to that property for how long, folks? Forever. Ever. Forever. Forever. As long as that property exists in the future, every future owner will have to honor these covenants. Now, I do not, Right now, I want you to say this. I want you to repeat it with me. Covenants are not a homeowner's association. Say it. Covenants are, Covenants are mm -hmm. not a homeowner's mm -hmm. association. Covenants are not a homeowner's association. A homeowner's association is not the same thing as covenants. Say it. Homeowners, homeowners association is not the same as not the same as covenants. I do not want you to make that connection in your brain. They are re potentially related to one another, but they do not automatically go. The covenants are the rules. What is a homeowner's association if one has been created? What is it? The enforcement. Enforcement. Like enforcement. I love that answer, Mark. I like, I, to love think that. Of, I like to think of the HOA, the homeowner association, as like the cops. They are the ones that police, are the ones that enforce those rules, are the ones that will make someone do something or, 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 or not do something. But they don't put these rules in place. These rules were put in place way before then. That's exactly right. The HOA is not the same thing as the rules. The HOA enforces the rules. But here's the thing, and this is where you really have to zone in because this will come as a test question. We're going to talk about it several times, but you need to zone in on me right here. The HOA is almost never going to be an answer on a test. If they're asking you who enforces covenants, they are not <laughs> asking you for an HOA. Because the truth is, the vast majority of the time, there is no HOA. Because the HOA is not the same thing as covenants. Can there be covenants without an HOA? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because all that means is there are rules, but there's no system of enforcement for those rules. They don't have any Karens in there. That, <laughs> well, but here's the thing. They don't have a group of Karens. They <laughs> might have a Karen because the truth is that's the answer they're looking for on the test. Really? And I'm sorry for all wonderful Karens that happen to be out there. They're looking for the Karen. That's the answer because in real life, folks, who enforces Covenants. The neighbors. There you go. Your the neighbor. neighbor. And I'm going to leave that singular. Your neighbor. Because it only takes how many? One. One. One here's, pissed off neighbor. Here's the deal. If there are covenants, there's always going to be more than one lot associated with those covenants. It might be two. It might be 22. It might be 222. The only people who can enforce the covenants are the people whose lots are subject to the same covenants as yours. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if there are 10 houses in the subdivision, 
who can enforce the rules on one of those homeowners? Just one of the other. A neighbor. Any of the other, how many? Nine. Nine, Nine or Nine. ten. Not anyone outside of the neighborhood. Can the police enforce those covenants? No. 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 Can the planning and zoning office at the city enforce those covenants? No. No, because no. those covenants only affect that particular area, that particular neighborhood. That's it. And so the, the enforcement comes from one or more of your neighbors who are subject to the same rules, the same covenants. In other words, you hold each other accountable. Does that make sense when we say it that way? Mm-hmm. With the covenants. Now, I've had people say, so how do you do that? You sue. You, you sue file you. a lawsuit. The, you're, take matters the, into your own hands. Don't neighbor don't. suing neighbor. That is how you take them to court. And you essentially, just like any other dispute, you go to court and you say, your honor, they agreed to not have their trash can in front of their house, but their trash can, here's a picture from three days ago, here's a picture from yesterday, and their trash can is clearly in front of their house. Make them put the trash can away. That is enforcing the covenants. It is a lawsuit, neighbor against neighbor. Now that you know that, do you see why a lot of homeowners have decided that it makes more sense to create a homeowners association to handle that so that they don't have to get down and dirty and do it directly. Blame it somebody else, blame the Karen. Right. But there's no requirement that there actually be a homeowners association. One of the things that we do have to be aware of, unfortunately, is that because covenants are pertinent, because they run with the land, there's a pretty high chance that if you go back far enough in time, you will find covenants that by today's standards would not only be objectionable, might even be illegal. I mean, it, when you remember that, you know, these are this is land that's been owned for hundreds of years privately. And any owner during that time could have placed these restrictions against the property. Those owners who knows what they wrote as far as restrictions went. And they may have written those restrictions at a time when unfortunately it was legal to say such things. Here's the way that's going to play out today. The covenants stay because covenants are pertinent. And how long do appurtenances last, folks? Forever. Forever. Because the covenants would be listed on what document that's never going to go away? The deed. The deed. The deed on a previous deed. That document's always going to be there. And so the covenants are always going to be there. What happens is you lose the ability to enforce them. How do we say covenants get enforced in the first place? Neighbor has to do what? Sue a neighbor. Sue. What do you think would happen? I'm just going to throw this out there because I have to give you a real world example. Let's say the covenants say you can't have any uh, any black people who live in the neighborhood and no persons of color and, and a neighbor sues and says, you sold your house to somebody who's black and you can't do that. The covenant says, so what do you think the judge is going to say? Bye. Bye. Throws it out of court. Get out of my face. Because by today's standards, even though those restrictions are still there on that piece of paper, they cannot any longer be enforced. Does that make sense for everybody? Well, legal, yes. Okay. And so that is what happens when we run across what can be very grotesque, quite honestly, covenants in some cases that by today's standards would be illegal. But if they again, violate you a, cannot remove them because they are a pertinent, they stay forever. Yep. So we just make them illegal and therefore they have no enforcement. They don't have any teeth. They don't have, they're not enforced. They are still part of the land because you cannot take, just like you cannot take away the ugly history of the nation or, uh, you know, our, you know, our, our area, those things are part of us. They're part of what shaped us. I mean, you know, it, I, I don't think you can ever remove yourself from the past. You shouldn't. Um, and the same thing is true for this land. I mean, you have to know that at some point this was the way this land was treated and this was the way the restrictions existed on this land. It's so a part of it, but you don't enforce it. Travis, when you're trying to sell where 
you've got some money and you're, you're trying to sell a house and they ask you, tell me about the neighborhood. You can say it's beautiful. The trees are beautiful. It's got nice roads. You can't really go into the demographics of a neighborhood. That's correct. We're going to talk about that when we get to fair housing extensively. But yeah, my, and that my was general, a question, by the way. My, my general golden rule of real estate is talk about the property, not about the people. Not the people. Yeah. I used to have that in a sign on the wall when, when uh-huh. Leslie and I ran a big firm. It was on it was on a, a, a poster size sign in the hallway. Talk about the property, not about the people. Yeah, you know, we got it. I the way I look at it is, I got a license to sell real estate, not to sell people who own real estate. Right. So I'm not selling people. People are not my line of work. I don't talk about people. Relevant to us. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, uh, So just make sure you understand we're not going to enforce those. Uh, Shay, I got your message. That's fine. Um, Encumbrances also extend to something. So another type of encumbrance, sticking with those bad appurtenances, the encumbrances. Another flea. Another flea. This is the kick. <laughs> this is even worse than a flea. <laughs> it's something called a lien. A lien is a debt. Lean on okay? A debt is monetary in nature. Here's the thing about liens, though, as it relates to real estate. When it comes to real estate, we have to be really worried about a certain type of liens called specific liens. Specific liens are the kinds of liens that we care about as real estate agents. And I'll tell you why. Because specific liens are encumbrances. And remember, all encumbrances are what a word? Pertinent. A pertinent to the property, attached to the property. So if a specific lien is attached to the property, do we, by that very nature, have to care about those specific liens? Even if we don't really care who borrowed the money or how they ended up owing the money, don't we really care about the fact that this debt is attached to the land itself? Yes. Yes. Because so, whoever owns it afterwards is going to have to deal with it. Well, that's it. The because land. the debt stays with the land. The debt stays with the land. So now we've told you at this point not to think about money owed. Now, <laughs> now we have to bring it into the picture. Now we have to open the floodgates and talk a little bit about money and financing. So let's talk about specific liens. And by the way, general liens are the other type of liens. Those are debts that are not attached to real estate. The general liens are attached to the person who owes the money. They're actually going to follow that person. A general lien is something that a person cannot escape. Can a person escape a specific lien? Yeah. How do you get out of a specific lien if you're a person? Rid of it. Sell it. Sell the property. Go buy the land. Get rid of the property, right? Get rid of the property. If you don't own the property anymore, do you care that it has a lien on the property? Nope. Not your problem. No. But a general lien attaches to you personally and follows you everywhere you go, like your shadow. So I like to think of specific lien as specific to the property. That's how I remember a specific lien is to the property. It's specific. It's more It's more directed to one thing, which is what we care about. Well, and that's, exact, it, and that's exactly it. Specific lien. Specific, I don't know why there's a drum roll there. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm like, what? I, no I know idea. you were so passionate about foreclosure. What just happened? I know. I know. I know, I know roll, please. A drum roll, please. <laughs> so specific liens are a type of lien. And what is what does a lien mean? What does it mean when we say something is a lien? It's a what? A pertinence. Well, it's a it's a it's an appurtenance, yes, but it's specifically a debt. It's money owed. Money owed. Right. So liens, liens represent money owed, but specific liens are money that's not owed by a person. Get out of your brain that specific <laughs> liens are is money owed by a person. It's money owed by the land. It's money 
that is debt that is attached to the land. Ultimately, what will be used to satisfy that debt if it's not paid in another way? The sale of that land. The sale of that land. And that's exactly what a foreclosure is, folks. A foreclosure is the forced closing, the forced sale of a piece of land in order to satisfy a specific lien. Here's what you need to understand. Specific liens are pertinent. So that means they do what? Um, stay, stay with, with, with the land. land. They stay, stay with the land. Yes. Specific liens represent money owed by the land. And specific liens create the right of the debt holder, not the, not the person who owes money, but the person who is owed money, the money, create the right of that person to do what with that property in order to collect on their debt. Sell it. Sell it. Sell it. Force the sale of it. Even though it's not their property, it gives them the right to force it to be what? Sold. 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 And what's the what's the whole point of forcing it to be sold? Satisfy the debt. To satisfy the debt. Foreclosure literally means forced sale. So uh Jay asked, so a mortgage is a specific lien. A mortgage note is a specific lien. Absolutely. Property tax liens against the property are specific liens. These are debts. Now, I want you to think about your, your note from your bank, your, your mortgage note from a bank. Is foreclosure like the first line of defense for paying that note? Or is there another way that is much easier and more friendly to satisfy that note? It's No, you can just sell the land, right? Well, you, you can, can sell, sell the land, the but what's the, more, what's the most common way to satisfy that note? Pay it, pay it. You, you, pay it you make payments. You make payments on it. That's the most common way. But why is foreclosure there lurking in case what? I don't in case pay. you don't pay. Or doesn't pay. But ultimately, here's what you need to understand, folks. And some of you, you think you're listening, but you're not listening. It's not sinking in. The money is not going to follow the person who borrowed the money. The debt is not going to follow the person who borrowed the money. It is a specific lien against the land. Where will the debt stay, even if the land is sold to a new owner? The debt with the land. With the land. What's the problem with the it new owner? It stays with the land. So, Practical question, and I'm going to Eddie. I see Eddie's hand up, but practical question. I want you to think about it. I want you to take, I'm going to use Amy and John since they're beside each other in my little camera view here. Let's say Amy owns a property and she has a $400,000 mortgage note lien against the property. She agrees to sell the property to John for $500,000. Everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. John shows up with $500,000 in cash in a suitcase and hands it to Amy. Why does it got to be a suitcase? <laughs> well, I mean, how else are you going to carry $500,000 in cash? Brown bag. A tote bag. He it's showed, very he, sus. He, he, well, we never said John wasn't sus. I mean, you know, you know you just, uh, yeah, we, we, you know, we don't know what John's doing. I mean, Les, <laughs> Le, Leslie's got a client who sells produce who buys property, who buys property uh, with land with cash all the time she came to me she said what do i do with this and she dumped like thirty thousand dollars in cash on my desk said, where'd you get that she's like well, it's, my, yes. it's my it's my it's my produce man i said what kind of produce is he selling i don't want to know <laughs> <laughs> uh, a side hustle is a side hustle exactly so amy that. has this property with four hundred thousand dollar mortgage note attached to it John pays her $500,000 for the property. Is there any guarantee, folks, 
that Amy's going to take four hundred thousand dollars of that money and satisfy that note. Is there any guarantee of no. that? No. 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 Run with it. <laughs> and if she takes the five hundred thousand dollars and runs with it, is John still going to have a lien attached to the property that he just purchased? Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. And if John doesn't satisfy that lien or Amy doesn't satisfy that lien or somebody doesn't pay that bank for that note, is the bank going to foreclose on John, the current owner of the property? Yes. Yes. They want money. yes. Even though he never borrowed the money, even though he never signed the loan documents, even though it's not going to impact his credit, his property would still be foreclosed on because he bought the property and the fleas come with the dog, folks. That specific lien was attached to the property. He that, told the he told the bank, listen, here's my house as collateral. Here's my house as a promise. Well, and that's the thing. He never had that conversation directly with the bank, but he took ownership knowing that was there because Amy had done it before him. So let me ask y'all a question. I don't know. Do you think that specific liens need to be recorded? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Eddie, you had your hand up. What's up? Did I lose it? Uh, no, I, I just I just wanted to ask, uh, <clears throat> since the appurtenance, I, I, I totally get what you're saying. I understand the foreclosure thing, but once that lien is satisfied, what happens to that appurtenance? It just gets dismissed? So, well, it's not dismissed. It's just been satisfied. So it, it, you would still see that there was that there's a lien attached to the property, but it's a lien that's now been satisfied. And a lien that's been satisfied no longer has the right for the lien holder to do what? Foreclose. To foreclose. That's exactly right. And so the truth is we don't care about liens that are satisfied because those cannot have any negative outcome. A lien that's been satisfied can't be what? What's the, what's the oh, foreclosed? But a lien that's not satisfied can be foreclosed. foreclosed. And that's what those are the ones that we have to worry about. So let me ask y'all a practical practical question. Did John mess up by handing Amy five hundred thousand dollars in cash? Yes. And, and not yes. requiring she satisfy that note. Yes. 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 Right there, the right there, we've introduced to you the need for somebody if john was smart to play a middle person somebody yeah. to hand somebody to handle the money somebody to make sure that that lien got satisfied before they gave amy the money what what professional do you think john might engage the services of to, to a broker attorney or how, how about a closing attorney Oh, how, about a, okay. how about a closing attorney? We, we yeah. don't use escrow agents in North Carolina, but other states use escrow agents. Same Baby idea. Sitter. <laughs> but a, a babysitter for the money. That's what closing attorneys and escrow agents do. They babysit the money. In other words, who should John give the $500,000 to? Directly to Amy or should he give it to the closing attorney? Closing attorney. Closing attorney. Closing attorney. With what instruction? Don't give Amy this money until she has done what? Until she satisfied the liens. And then you can give her my money. How many of you all think that'd be a much better way for John to go about purchasing this property? Yes. yes. Yeah. 100%. It keeps Amy alive, too. It, it, it keeps Amy alive. Exactly. Exactly. That's what John said. Because here's the thing. Amy's already going to be on some beach in the Dominican Republic somewhere. You can't get her back. You know, she's got... <laughs> She's not even aiming anymore. She's got, she's not aiming anymore. Exactly. Uh, uh, she, she, That's Shakira right there. She, she's got some, she's got some umbrella drinks on the beach somewhere. Um, so, so somebody sent me a private message, which I totally understand. And, and, and I think this is the confusing part for some of you. You know, this person said, it's crazy to me that mortgages, or I guess this debt will be specific versus a general lien since it's given to that person to purchase that property. If it's if, if the money is given to this person who's asking for, for the loan, why want to be a general lien, right? Place on that person. Well, think about it. That person who's borrowing the money is telling this bank or this mortgage, if I don't pay you, 
you can take the house from me. Well, and think about it from the lender's perspective. If you're the lender, which would you rather have? Would you rather have the ability to go sue a person for your money? Or would you have rather have the legal ability to force the sale of something that you know has value to get your money in a much more quick manner? Which one would you rather have? Land as collateral or the ability to sue a person? Land. Land as collateral. That's why we do, that's why the lender would rather do a specific lien on the mm -hmm. property. And remember, that can be done because at that point in time, when Amy took out that note, who owned the land? Somebody else? Amy. Amy. Amy did. Amy. She's pledging land that she owns as collateral. She is the owner. She can pledge it as collateral. She can place a lien against her own property, but that lien is going to stay there until it's satisfied or until it's foreclosed. Those are the how only two. We, as a broker, how would we as a broker be concerned with a general lien? Well, we generally would not be concerned with a general lien because general liens don't have anything to do with real estate. So all you need to know is the differentiation between, you Got need it. to know a lot about specific liens, but general liens, you just need to know that there are liens. How many of you ever heard of a judgment? Tommy's got a judgment against him for unpaid <laughs> child support. How many of you ever heard that expression? Yes. Folks, judgments are examples of general liens. Okay. Judgments, so if you, if you have unpaid child support and you get a judgment against you, if you're sued and you get a judgment against you, if you um, owe somebody money and you get a judgment placed against you, those are all examples of general liens. If you owe the IRS money, they will place a general lien against you. That is really horrible for that one person. Wow. But, the rest, but the rest of the world does not care. because those, those So we're working with somebody and they say they have a lien against them. They tell us that as their, you know, seller of their property. Do we react to that or against them per say, against them personally yes if it's against them personally we don't care it's none of our business but okay. if it's against that property we care got it okay if it's yeah, we don't care about the people we care about what the property Land. 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 okay so i have a question so like for that specific scenario we as real estate agents wouldn't care but like the loan officer and those people would care right because that would be a, impacting their pre-approval or whatever. Well, but again, that's that is only impacts that person. It has nothing to do with the actual real estate. We're not their lender. We're not their attorney. We're not. Our job is the land transaction. And so, somebody having a lien against them personally, a general lien, is simply none of our business. But well, would we want to continue to work with them knowing that they're a schlub and they're not going to be able to purchase this property? Well, that, that's an entirely different story. So that, that's a, that is a practical question of do you want to, as a rule of thumb, and this is, again, it's an open question for you to answer, only work with people that are qualified to purchase. That's where something like a pre-approval comes into the process. Right. So it's none of my business whether they have a general lien against them. What would be my business is whether or not they're qualified to complete the transaction that they're, I don't need to know why they can or why they can't. I just need to know, yes, they can, or yes, they can. Got it. So okay. when somebody comes to me and says, well, I got a judgment against me for unpaid child support, I'm going to say, I appreciate you sharing, but that's none of my business. But have you talked to a lender? Because it may impact that. All I need to know is whether or not the lender is willing to make a loan. Got it. Well, Okay. We will discuss way more detail, in-depth, uh, practical stuff when you guys get to post-licensing with me. Yeah. But until until now, we're just going to keep it as let the lender do their job, let the attorney do their job. Uh, otherwise, we're going to get confused and, and, and you, you know, we, we're not going to be able to answer the right questions. Sure. Okay. So these specific liens attached to the real estate, they are liens against the property. First of all, test question. Do you think specific liens need to be recorded at the county courthouse? Does yes. it, so, it, so before you just fire off and say yes, because that here's going to be your tendency to always say yes. The answer to that question is not going to always be yes. Here's what I want you to think about. We only bother to record things that would impact future 
owners of the property. If it would have no impact whatsoever on a future owner of the property, we don't record it. So would a specific lien potentially impact future owners of the property? Yeah. yeah. Yes. A specific lien absolutely would impact future owners of the property because the lien stays what? With the, the property, land. The, land. The, land. the property. So do you think specific liens need to be recorded? Yes. 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 Do. General liens. Do they impact future owners of this piece of real estate? No. No. So would a general lien need to be recorded at the county courthouse? No. No. A deed. Does a deed impact future owners of the property? Yes. 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 So does it need to be recorded? Yes. 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 A, sales contract, ooh, a sales contract between a buyer and a seller. Will that impact future owners of the property or does it only impact these two people right now and then it's over and done? Just them two. Just those two. Just those two. Just those two. The, Jay, you said yes, future. How's it going to impact future owners? How how are people 200 years from now going to care about the contract between buyer, seller A and buyer B right now? How are they going to care? I was, I, I was thinking about the specific lien. Oh, a lien. Yes. No, but no. a contract, a sales contract oh, no, no, between... No. A buyer and a seller right now, are future owners 200 years from now going to care about that sales contract? No. no so no, would no. a sales contract need to be recorded? No. No. But would future owners 200 years from now care about the deed between that that buyer and yes. that seller right now? Yes. 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 And that's why that's got to be recorded. See, that's the way you're going to learn to answer those questions when they're talking about what needs to be recorded, what doesn't need to be recorded. Watch how fast you can do it. A lease. Let's say, let's say Pearl owns a property right now and she's leasing it to Tanya. Owners 200 years from now, is that lease between those two parties right now going to impact owners 200 years from now? No. 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 So is there any requirement that that, that, that document be recorded? No. 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 See how easy it is when you think of it that way? That's the way I always think of what needs to be recorded versus an easement. Will that easement impact owners 200 years from now? Yes. 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 So does an easement need to be recorded? Yes. 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 See how see how that works, right? You can always tell whether a do legal document needs to be recorded by thinking about it in those terms. Is it going to impact somebody who owns this property 200 years from now? And specific liens definitely will, especially if they have not been satisfied. Most of these are voluntary. What that means is that the owner of the property is in agreement with them. They like, for example, the mortgage note that we keep talking about. Nobody forces the owner of the property to borrow that money. Most of the time when we're looking at mortgage notes, the owner of the property wants to borrow this money. They're, they're very willingly borrowing this money. So that's a voluntary lien. They're, they're signing, giving their permission for the lien to be placed on the property. Now, here's my question for you. And it goes back to what we were just talking about. Is the mortgage lender going to want to record that lien against that property? Yes. 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 Because they want to make sure that not only does the current owner honor that lien, but every what? Future. 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 Future owner. Because here's what they don't want to have happen. If they don't record their lien, folks, and Leslie goes out tomorrow and sells her house, can they foreclose on the next owner if they didn't record their lien? No. Nope. No, because their new the new owner didn't have the right, didn't did not know right? That this lien existed. But if that lender goes out and records that lien, does the next owner have to honor that lien because they took the ownership of the property knowing that the lien was there? I think yes. by recording it, the way I see it is by recording it, you're attaching it to the land. You are. You're making, and not only attaching it to the land, but making everybody aware of it. It's all about making people aware. It's about making that next owner aware. These are the fleas that come with this dog, okay? And so one of the other examples of a specific lien is something called a mechanics lien. 
which might also be called a workman's lien or a material man's lien. Mechanics lien is the most common terminology, but it means the same thing. This is an example of a specific lien. So, practical question. Can a mechanics lien result in a foreclosure? Yes. 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 Because every specific lien can result in foreclosure. I saw the comment there in the chat was I looked up a property last night. The bank recorded uh, when I paid off my construction loan. They Exactly. They noted that you had satisfied that mm -hmm. lien so that future owners know there was a lien, but it's already been what? Satisfied. 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 There you go. So a mechanics lien is a specific lien that gives the right to some workmen or some construction company or some vendor who provides material because it could be for material, it could be for labor, it could be for time, it could be for services rendered on the property. But basically anybody who provides services to a piece of real estate or materials to a piece of real estate. So examples, an architect could file a mechanics lien against a property. If you have an architect come out and draw up plans for a new, a, a new structure on a property and you don't pay them, can that architect file a specific lien against that land for, for the service that they've rendered to the property owner? Yes. 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 HVAC company, electricians, builders, uh, construction companies, landscapers, uh, uh, heck, even um, like pest control companies can file these specific liens against the property as my long dad, as uh, my dad does concrete work and he has he has done that before with you know big company or big uh, uh, jobs that are going to take a while um and, and it's a way for this person this company this entity to secure their payment their compensation for work that they have done so that the owner doesn't just take off and never pays them well, and there it is right there. Why bother filing this lien? It's a, it's a way to guarantee payment because now what you've essentially said is if you don't pay me, I have the right to force what action on your property? Okay. Open up a can of whoop Foreclosure. ass. Foreclosure, exactly. I can open up a can of whoop ass and force you to sell your property in order to pay me. Does that make sense for that? Mm -hmm. okay. Someone asks, is there a minimum amount? No, there's no minimum amount. Now, from a practical standpoint, generally you want to money them, to file the it, it costs money to file the <laughs> lien. You don't, I mean, you got probably gonna have to pay an attorney to draft the lien right. up for you, the documents associated with the lien. You're gonna have to pay a recording fee at the courthouse. There's a filing fee that goes along with it. So it costs several hundred dollars to create the lien. So you're probably not going to see a lien filed for 50 bucks. But in theory, it could be for $50. I mean, there's no, there's no minimum limit here. There's just a practical sort of it ain't worth our time. Um, usually, once you get into the several thousand dollars, that's when these uh, vendors are willing to file these liens against a property. Okay. And so... Any vendor can file these liens as long as they were hired by the owner of the property. How many of you have ever gotten a knock on your door and somebody's selling vinyl siding or windows or roofing or whatever? What's the first thing they ask you? Are you the what? Owner. owner. Are you the owner, owner. of the property? Because they, they only have the right to file a lien against the property if the work was authorized by the owner of the property. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. Okay, so if the work was authorized by the owner. Now, here's the thing. Rather than just memorize this, I want you to think about the practicality of why this is needed. Would it be kind of crazy if some contractor came and filed a lien against the property because they weren't paid 10 years ago for installing a toilet in the house? Would that be kind of weird mm -hmm. that they had the ability to come back after some unlimited period of time and file a lien against the property wouldn't that be wouldn't that be kind of crazy yes yeah. okay. so the state of north carolina and the, the, the north carolina flag is here because this is state specific the state of north carolina has instituted a filing deadline there's a time limit 
the vendor has 120 days after they stop working on the property. So from the last time they visit that property to provide work, the clock starts to run. How long does the vendor have to go to the county courthouse and file a lien against this property if that's what they want to do? 120 days. 120 days. That doesn't mean they're not owed the money if they wait. If they wait two years, they're still owed the money, but they lose the right to file a lien against the property after 120 days, which is basically four months. So, so four months after they've stopped working on the property, they lose the right to file a lien. Is everybody okay with that? Yep. Yes. Yep. So here's the practical way that's going to play out. If you are buying property, if you are buying property in the state of North Carolina, do you need to be concerned about recent work that has been done on the property but might not be paid for? Yes. 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 yes because could there have been things done recently, especially to get the thing ready to put on the market, that have not been paid for? What do y'all think? Yeah. Yep. Yes. For sure. Remember, these liens do not attach to people. They attach to what? Property. To property. Yeah. Property. So let me just give you a hypothetical situation. Let's say that Mina is going out looking at property. And it's got a beautiful new kitchen in it. She loves it. She puts an offer in right away. She closes 30 days later. There are no liens against the property when she closes on it. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Yes. Could a lien still be attached to that property even after it's been sold to Mina if the kitchen was never paid for and the work was done within the 120 days previous? Yes. 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 So she's got to be worried about that. So when you go look at a property as a buyer in this state and you see things that are new or recently done, you need to make sure one of two things. Either it was done when, at least when? Over 120 days, days ago. At least 120 days before. Or if it was done within the most recent 120 days, what do you want to see before you will close on that property? A receipt. A receipt, a receipt showing that it has been paid for. Because otherwise, could Mina purchase her new house and then end up with an $85,000 lien attached to that property by the contractor who never was paid for that new kitchen? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. And folks, that happens all the time when buyers don't do their homework. Research. And see, Alyssa said, is this something that attorneys check for? Yes, Alyssa, but here's what you need to understand. Checking's not enough here because these liens can be filed after the fact. The attorney might check the day before closing. Oh, there are no liens on the property. Could the lien be filed after Mina buys the property? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And that's why it's up to Mina to make sure that there's nothing that's going to jump out of the claws and invite her after she buys this property. So here's the thing. If I'm, if I'm walking through a property as a buyer and the seller's telling me, Oh, we just put a new roof on, or we just put a new kitchen, or we just put a new floor. And I'm, I'm like, literally, I'm like making a list. I'm like, Oh, you really? And the seller thinks you're asking because you're like all into it. Like you, you fixed what? And listen, they're happy to volunteer because they're trying to sell it. Right. Oh, we replaced the water here. Oh, you did a water here. Okay, water here. Okay. Uh, oh, and you did a roof. Yeah, oh, you did a roof. Yeah, yeah, roof, roof, roof. I'm, I'm writing it all down. And then I'm going to say, is that everything? Is that everything you've done? I mean, because I want to make sure that when I make my offer, I'm giving you credit for everything you've done. Is that everything you've done? They're happy to tell you about it. And once I got a list of everything they've done, see, Shay, you can search debts. But again, that's not going to work for these things always because the lien can be filed when folks after, after, the, after, the, the, after the fact it's not enough so when i make that list of everything they've done what do i didn't do turn it around and shove it right under their nose and say what 
Receipt. Receipt, 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 asshole. I want to see every single one of these things that you just told me you did to this property. I want to see where it's been paid for because I ain't buying it till I see it. Yep. Because then otherwise you're going to be inheriting that headache. That's exactly right. Good. So Travis, can you, uh, can you purchase that property? Let's say you already make a contract. But can you put in the contract that you want to close after a certain amount of days so that way sure. it doesn't that could be part of the contract? Would that be a good idea to wait 120 days after you've seen the property and make sure it's in the same condition? If there's exactly. nothing done for 120 days, you would know you would be clear of any, at least any liens that there could be no unknown liens that come into existence at that point in time. Right. The ones that are recorded are the ones that are there. Right. Christina, you had a question? Yeah, so um, when that thing said and done, can Mina then go for that person and it can be now be like a general lien? No, it, these are specific liens. I'm not sure what you're, I'm not sure what, what you're asking there. Yeah, so I know that it's a specific, but Okay, so she got it, closed the house, and then they go after her. Um, no, they don't go after her. She doesn't owe the money. She didn't hire the work. They go after the what? They oh, go after the property. They go after the property. They're not going to talk to, they're not going to try, they're not going to say, Mina, you owe us this money. They're going to say, Mina, figure out how to satisfy this lien, or we're going to foreclose on the property. It's up to Mina how this gets, sh how it shakes out from there. But she inherited this problem by buying the property. Property owns the money. They're not yes. coming after Mina. Stop it. There's no <laughs> but. They're not coming after Mina. It's not a general lien. It's a what? It's a specific, specific, lien. specific lien. lien. They're not coming after Mina. They're coming after what, folks? Your property. The property. property. The property. They're going to foreclose on the property. And that's how it impacts Mina because she's going to potentially lose ownership of the property that she just bought. The P in specific stands for property. That's it. Not person. Not person. Okay. <laughs> Don't do that to yourself. Well, that sucks. <laughs> they're coming after the land. That's what they're coming for. What you're going to do when they land. come for you. You don't need to worry about these next two slides. They're not going to get specific enough on the state section to worry about the foreclosure deadlines. You don't have to worry about that. What you do need to pay attention to is something called lean priority. So this is where you get you get too deep into the details and you're not really catching the full perspective of things, folks. Are there often many liens against a piece of property? Not just one lien, but many liens at the same time. Yes. 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 There could be a lien for property taxes that have not been paid. There could be a mortgage note. Heck. There could be, as John just said, there could be a first mortgage note and a second mortgage note. There could be a first mortgage note, a second mortgage note, and a home equity line of credit. There could be all of that plus outstanding property taxes. There could be property taxes, three mortgages, and two mechanics liens against the property. Could there be 10 different liens against this one property? Yes. Yes. One naughty owner. Here's why <laughs> that really matters. If and when the property is sold, those liens need to be satisfied. In a perfect world, and this is often the case, this is most often the case, thankfully, when a property is sold, it's sold for enough money to satisfy all the liens that are out there against the property. Does that make sense for everybody? That there's enough money there to satisfy all these liens. Everybody with me on that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Is it possible, though, and is that particularly true in a foreclosure sale, that there are more liens, more total debt than the sales price of the property will justify. Is that a possibility? Yes. 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 It yes. is. It is. And that's where this phrase, lean priority, really, really becomes important. 
because lenders have to get in line. Lien holders have to get in line. And the order, of, the order of the line is not always going to, I want, think about it. If you go to Disney World, is the person who's been in line the longest always going to be the next one to ride to ride? Um, no. No. That's one of the factors. But if you've ever been, they got what they call fast passes. Fast pass. They call it genie now. Something, you know, right? And, uh -huh. and listen, be, y'all be honest. Don't you hate the asshole in the fast pass line if you've been standing there for an hour and a half? And don't, yes. you, don't you just want to reach right out and trip them as they walk by? Right? Oh, <laughs> right? And then hey, you how much you want for one of them fast passes? And then you, exactly how much you want for it, right? <laughs> and, and then sometimes you get to be the asshole. You get to be the skip the line, right? And you just walk past all those people. I don't even look at them. I can't look you in the eye. I'm looking the other way. I'm just keep walking. I, I, I'd be like this the whole time. I don't. I can't look at you if I'm walking past you in the That's fast. That's how embarrassed you should be for cutting right? line. But look, there's another look. There's another one that most of us don't even know about if you've got real deep pockets you can hire like a disney cast member and you just skip you don't even have to go through the fast pass line they just take you right on the ride they just i'm buy afraid, that. I'm afraid yeah. to ask why do you know this oh i looked it up i looked <laughs> it up it starts at like fifteen hundred dollars an hour and you gotta do at least what? six hours Oh my God. And that doesn't even include your park tickets. That is, I have stupid somebody, money. Yeah. yeah. Somebody right. better get to work in the polls, is all it, I got to say. Exactly. You know, <laughs> it, it, but, but here's what I'm saying though. So there's different levels of priority. And yep. you're you're gonna go based on your priority. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Wait, your right? turn. You're gonna go based on priority liens work exactly the same way it's not just about who shows up first it's not just about which liens get in line first different ones have different priorities so let's talk about is everybody understand are you is your brain in the right standpoint of where i'm coming from here yep so what we're talking about is which liens are going to get paid first first when the so which where would you rather be at the beginning of the line to get paid first or at the end of the line beginning mm -hmm. the front because if you're at the back of the line is there a chance the park's gonna close and you ain't gonna get to ride to ride yeah if you're at the back of the line for uh, for lean priority is there a chance you won't get paid even though the property's been sold mm -hmm. that's right that's, that's enough right. money yes and so this priority matters a lot. This is the priority. Learn this slide. Learn this priority. It is super important. There will be a test question. Here's what we mean. Wait, what? You think this will be on the test? Absolutely. Oh, no man. doubt. What liens will get paid first? in any sale what is number one on this list in any sale if they're there now if they're not there we just skip to the next level what gets paid first property, property tax no look on no. the slide that is number two and that will show up as an answer and you'll be wrong that's not number one What's number one, folks? The foreclosure, the foreclosure sale. The foreclosure sale itself. There are costs associated with foreclosing on the property. And those costs get paid first if it's a foreclosure sale. Now, if it's not a foreclosure sale, can we just cross out number one and move straight on to number two if it's not a foreclosure yes. sale? Yes. Right. But what does, that, what does that mean, Travis? Is that attorneys? Yes, it's attorneys, okay. it's trustees, it's the cost of, listen, is there a cost associated with changing the locks on the property? Yes. Yep. Is there a cost associated with boarding it up so people don't go in there? Yeah. Yep. 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 There, the there, there is cost associated with foreclosing on the property, folks, and those costs get paid first. They jump the line. 
So that's somebody the, has to go in and clean the shit out of there. That's it. They're that's included. all. That's all going to get paid first before okay. any of the liens get satisfied. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. Okay. So that comes off the top. Then what liens get priority? What's the fast pass line for the next liens? Rural property taxes. taxes. Rural property, taxes. Property, taxes. property taxes and special assessments that are outstanding on the property. So a special assessment is just another form of taxation. A special assessment is like a special one-time tax that's been assessed to the property, usually as a result of the government coming through and making some type of improvement on the property, like placing sidewalks on the property. That would result in a one-time tax to the property called a special assessment or putting water and sewer pipes on the property. That could result in a one-time tax. Your annual property taxes are annual taxes. Special yeah. assessments are one time, but they get this second level priority. So here's the thing, which is going to get paid first. A mortgage oh. lien that's been around since 2010, been in line since 2010, or your 2021 property taxes, which one's going to get paid first? The 2021, 2021 property taxes, because 2021 property taxes jumps the line ahead of mortgage notes. Which one would get paid first? Your 2019 property taxes or the cost of foreclosing on the property right now? Cost of foreclosure. Cost of foreclosing, because that gets special priority. Does everybody see that? Yep. Now, once we've paid the cost of the foreclosure, then we pay property taxes. Once we've paid the property taxes and special assessments, then we pay any outstanding mortgage notes on the property. Once we've paid any outstanding mortgage notes, then we get down here to filing and paying the mechanics liens. Folks, what if, the, what if we run out of money? They don't get paid. They don't get paid. They don't get paid. Sorry. So can, they go after, so can they go after that person? They, then get, after? they can, but that's beyond our pay grade because, again, that's no longer related to the what, folks? Property. 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 To the property, and we only care about the what? Property. <laughs> the property. 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 Can they go sue somebody and get a general lien against that person? Sure, but that's beyond our pay grade. Okay. We care about the real estate. We care about the specific liens. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Yes. Okay. So let me go and activate this question. Y'all can take a look at it while I'm activating it here. Give me just a second. So it says, which of the following liens will be likely, will be likely need to be paid? Would likely need it to, I can't do this. First, from the proceeds of a sales transaction in a parcel of real estate. You have outstanding unpaid property tax liens, A, or B, debt owed to the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, for unpaid income taxes. C, first mortgage of $175,000 owed to Bank of America. Or D, cost of the property being foreclosed, such as trustees, fees, and court costs. Y'all go ahead and, and, and fill your answer in. Which of the following liens, which of those liens would need to be paid first, first. from a property being sold? Would it be the uh, of these that are listed, outstanding property tax liens, debt owed to the internal real estate service, First mortgage of $175,000 owed to Bank of America or uh, the cost of the property being foreclosed? Which one do you think would need to be paid? Can we see the answers, Travis? Yeah, I'm not sure it's showing the results, total results, but it's not showing them. Get out. No, it's not doing that. Huh. Oh, hey. Um, Kick you out. Why did it do that? It doesn't like you. You effed it up. It's uh, that it's that Microsoft. Is that my? It's, it's that Windows 11. Ooh, so I thought about it this morning Seriously. when I was when I was uh, um I turned my computer on. I got the message. Would you like to upgrade to a better <laughs> and, and improve? I said, Hell no, not now. 
Let me let Travis be the guinea pig on this one. Right. <laughs> they need to fix the bugs. I don't know why it's not showing it. Uh, it's okay. We can see okay. it okay. in the chat. All right. So what do y'all think the answer is? What do y'all think the answer is? D. 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 Of those listed, D would be the one that would show up first. Absolutely. Would be the one that would be paid first. Good. D would be a general. Right. And if we actually wanted to rank them in order, which one would get paid first is D. Which one would get paid second? Property taxes. A, mm -hmm. right? A. Outstanding property taxes. Which one would get paid third from the sales mm -hmm. proceeds? B. C. C. D. C. First mortgage. C. The C. first mortgage. Which one would not have anything at all to do with the sale of real estate? Well, uh, revenue. D, the Internal Revenue Service, because that would be a what kind of lien? That'd be a general uh, lien. General lien. General lien. That doesn't have yeah, anything general. to do with the real estate. They'll try to throw you off. It will. It wouldn't be applied to that at all. Yeah. All right. B has no application to us and to the, the sale of the real estate because B is a general lien. Now, could a general lien result in having to sell real estate? Sure, but a general lien is not directly tied to the real estate. Um, so mm -hmm. the, the question was, I, I, it's so weird for me to see my name asking a question. Oh my God, I was Travis, just thinking that. Travis, <laughs> question, so, it says, so here's a sales transaction means foreclosure. So a foreclosure is a sales transaction. Do not separate them in your mind. A foreclosure is just a sales transaction that was forced. That's all it means. A foreclosure sale is no different than any other sale. A foreclosure sale is a sale. Don't, don't confuse a foreclosure with somebody taking the property. That's right. the, the biggest misconception. That and and, and Mary Ann, the question would not specify if it's a foreclosure because a foreclosure is just a what, folks? Sales transaction. It's a sale. That's all it is. Foreclosure is a sale. Um, it's just a forced was, one. Um, I think someone from a previous, I'm sorry, meaning on Popsicle. Um, I'm thinking of somebody from a previous class who is thinking that there was a change to the lien priority. And I, and I wanted to share it in case anybody else had the same thought. Um, no, it, it is the same. It's just before this one, or I think it might even be after, basically the cost of the foreclosure sale comes in if there's a foreclosure. But if you see one that just starts with property taxes, that's as if there's no. Well, the, um, what you're what you're getting at here, I I think, is that there won't always be cost of a foreclosure sale. That would only right. come into play if it was a foreclosure. But if it is a foreclosure, do those costs take priority over the other liens? Yes. 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 And so you have to apply what makes sense in a given situation. If there are foreclosure costs, those always go screaming to the top of the list. Is there always going to be somebody on every ride at Disney who is being hosted by a Disney cast member? No, probably not. But if they're there, do they go screaming to the top of the line? Yep. yep. Yes. Right. And so that's what you've got to understand is that certain ones take priority if they're there. If they're not there, then move on down the list to the next one. Okay. Everybody good with that? Yep. Yes. Now, the most common spe uh, specific lien on any property in North Carolina is the property tax lien. That is by far the most common example of a specific lien in North Carolina. And the reason it's the most common example is because every property is subject to property taxation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, somebody sent a private question. What's an example of a specific lien affecting personal property? It can't. Specific liens, specific liens attached to what, folks? Just the land. Property. Land. land. And land is not personal property. Land is real, real. property. 
right? Specific liens doesn't impact personal property. Specific liens only impacts land, which is real <laughs> property. The most common example of a specific lien. So therefore the most common example of a type of uh, lien affecting real property is the property tax lien. In North Carolina, the law that gives the right for a property to be taxed is called the Machinery Act. Properties in North Carolina, land, you can substitute land here, are taxed based on their assessed market value, not based on their current market value. That's a different thing, but based on their assessed market value. What has the government assigned as a value to this property. So, so Leslie, is there confusion there? Talk about that for just a second. I, I need to run to the door real quick. Talk about, is there confusion? Is there a difference between the assessed value of a property and its current market value, number one. And is there a difference between properties that are located in a city versus properties not located in a city? Talk about those two things for just a second. So the property assessed value, we're talking about the county saying, hey, this is how much we estimate, we say this property is worth the actual market value of the property is not what the county or not what the government says the property is worth, is what other buyers are willing to pay for that property. And there's a difference between those two things. The county or the city is going to value these properties based on whatever terms they have. And they, somebody mentioned every eight years, we're gonna talk about that as well. And they're going to use different charts and so we're gonna use different methods to do so. The market, what a buyer is willing to pay can go up and down. It can vary. I mean, right now we're looking at market values in ridiculous amounts. How many of you guys have like own property right now and you have seen your a tax bill and it tells you how much your property is worth. How many of you guys laugh at that number when you see it and you're like, Psh, I paid way more for my property. They are different, right? They're very, very different. There is also a difference. So speaking of the county assess value, this is what the county or the city or the state will think the property is worth homeowners land is going to be taxed based on that amount what the government thinks the property is worth not what buyers are paying for this property out there does that does that make sense these numbers are different the yes. government is going to put some sort of a value on this property and that is where they're going to determine this is the amount of money that you are going to pay in taxes for this property all right now, depending on where the property is located, some properties are located closer to the city, within the city limits, we like to say, and some properties are located in the country, as we say, outside of city limits. So we are going to, the, the government taxes those a little bit different. Well, that's exactly right. Well, the, here's the real question. The, the government is sort of a misnomer. If a property is located in a city, it's actually subject to two layers of government. Right, it's subject really. to the county's governance, but mm -hmm. also subject to the city's governance. In short, if a piece of land is located in a city, it's going to be taxed not once for property taxes, but what, folks? Twice. 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 It's going to be taxed at the county level and at the what? City level. City, city, level. city level, whereas a property, a piece of land that's located strictly in the county, but not located in any city's jurisdiction will only be taxed how many times? Once. 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 There are, pro so what are the, what are the words that you look for in a test question that would tell you this property is only located in a single 
tax area. Only in a Located, located in a rural area, located in an unincorporated area of Orange County. If it says the property is located in Greensboro, folks, is it going to be subject to just city, just county taxes or both city and county taxes? No. If it says the city property located county. in Greensboro, which one? City and county. City and county. Both city and county. Every property is subject to county taxes. County taxes. So let, let me throw this out there. Leslie's home is located in an unincorporated rural area of Johnston County. So is her home subject to Johnston County taxes? Just County. Clayton City taxes or both? Which one? Just one. The county. The, county. the county. My home is located in the city or town of Cary. Oh. So is my property going to be subject to both. just the Wake County taxes or both the city and county taxes? Both, both. both. City and yeah. county taxes. Both, both city and county taxes. So you just need to pay attention to where it says the property is located in the test question. Don't make that harder than it is. Property is located in Garner. Just county or city and county? Both. City and both county. City and city county. And county. Both. Properties located in a rural area of Edgecombe County, just county or city and county? County, county. 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 One. county only. Don't make it harder than it is. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Now, yep. as, as Leslie said, there is a big difference between the current market value of the property and the assessed market value of the property. The assessed market value is like an assigned valuation for the property. That value is assigned to the property. That value has been assigned to the property by the government that is overseeing or has jurisdiction over that property. And so that value is only going to be used for taxation purposes. It has no relevance to the sale of the property. It is a value that has strictly been assigned. It has been pulled from thin air by the local <laughs> government as a basis for calculating taxation on the property. Well, that in, is in the assessed value. And earlier, I mentioned that the, you know, the actual value of the property is what other buyers are willing to pay, which is very much a market base, right? What buyers are willing to pay now, it might be different than what buyers are willing to pay later. And it has other factors associating supply and demand. I mean, all of those things. And those are going to be different. Why, why is the assessed value, some people ask, why is the assessed value so different than the actual market value? Well, take a look at how often the, 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 the state is reassigning this number to that property. We're talking about eight years. A lot of things can happen in eight years. Remember that, that number. It, it, it's going to be important for you. That's exactly at, right. This assigned or assessed value, the, the first three letters are asked because that's exactly where they pull that number from. They're asked right out of thin air. <laughs> and they only are required by law to pull a new number from their ass. How often, folks? Every eight, eight years. years. Every, eight eight Every eight, eight years. years. Is the actual market value of the property going to fluctuate tremendously up, down, and in between oh, during God. an eight-year cycle? Of yes. course. Yes. 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 But the assigned or assessed market value is not because it's only going to be assigned once every what? Eight, eight years. years. Eight years. Now, here's the thing, though. That doesn't necessarily mean that the property tax bill is going to stay the same for eight years on the property because the rate that's being used to calculate the bill can change annually. So rates can change how often? And every year. Annually. But assigned values change how often? Every eight, every eight years. years. Every eight years. Does that make sense for everybody? Are we locked in on that? Yep. Okay. 
So let's look at the annual tax calendar. And again, this is very North Carolina specific. So this could potentially show up on the North Carolina section of the exam. Let's look at the annual taxation calendar for any piece of real estate in the state of North Carolina. On an annual basis, every January 1st. So did this just happen, by the way, for 2022? Yes. Yep. Yes. yes. So on January 1st of every year, a new lien is placed against every single piece of real estate in the state of North Carolina. So do I have a new property tax lien against my home in Cary, North Carolina as of January 1, 2022? Yes. Yep. Yes. I sure do. Do I have any idea how much money I owe to the town of Cary and Wake County as a result of that lien? No. No. no, no, they haven't even figured out how much I owe them yet. But that is imagine, savage, Travis. it is savage. They have the ability to place an unknown lien against my property as soon as the clock strikes midnight. Happy New Year, asshole. <laughs> You've got a lien against your property. <laughs> That's the way it works. But I won't even know how much that lien reflects as far as a bill until when, folks? September. 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 Nine so months later. Here's my practical question. Can I pay the property taxes that I owe to the town of Cary right now? No. 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 I owe them, but I can't pay them because I don't know how much they are. You so, Travis, let me get this are. right. So, you've got an unknown tax lien against you on January the 1st, based on a number pulled from your ass. Their ass. Yeah. Yep. It's a wonderful country we live in. It is. And the only thing you said that I would correct there, I don't have a lien against me. I, the lien is against the property. The property, the property uh -huh. sorry. It's against the property. There is an, a, a, a lien against my property, which could result in the foreclosure of my property for an unknown amount of money. Will there be a known amount of money attached to that lien at some point in time? Will that lien materialize into an exact amount of money at some point in the future? Yes. 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 In September. In September. So here, here is a very practical problem that we have to deal with in selling real estate, folks. And this is a very practical problem that we have to deal with every single day in selling real estate. Are we essentially asking buyers to take over property with some unknown lien attached to it if we sell property in January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August? Anytime yes. before yes. September, yes. they're taking over that, that lien and don't even know how much it's for. That's exactly right. When, when they take over that property, they're taking over that property with a lien attached for an unknown amount of money. There is no way around that. That's some BS right there. It is some BS. So it's just the way it works. If you don't want to take over a property with an unknown lien, wait and purchase it when? September. September, September or later. Yes. That's the way it works. I mean, <laughs> other than that, you're lucky. just taking a chance. And I've had people say, well, how do you handle that? They're taking a leap of faith. But is it really a huge leap of faith or can they look at historic property tax bills and get a pretty good idea of what leap of faith they're taking? But remember, yeah. the value has been already assessed on the property, right? right. And so, can't, so can't we look at the property tax bill from 2019, 2020, 2021, exactly. right? See, Katie, we're, we're not talking about loans now. right now. Katie, that, you, that's the cardinal mistake. We're not talking about loans. No, the, uh, these people are purchasing these properties with cash right now. They don't have a loan against these properties. And even if you own the property free and clear, do you still owe property taxes on an annual basis? Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. And so somebody who purchases property in February, they know that at some point later in the year, this lien is going to turn into an amount of money that is owed. Does that make sense for everybody when I say it that way? Yeah, yeah yep. there's ones in the I previous years are around the same uh, amounts usually. 
Right. I mean, so the, the ones from the previous years are the best estimate of what this year's will look like when it finally does materialize into an actual amount of money. I may have said this before on Wednesday. I can't remember, but you know, like this, this question is like uh, Katie's question and, and other questions that I, that I've seen. I think you guys are applying real life situations and you're trying to mix them in with this. This is a building block situation. Here, right. guys. We're not talking about mortgage yet. We're just talking about liens on a property. So I know where your question is coming from, Katie, but we cannot mix them right now. They have to be separated. So um, it's, it's absolutely true that you can make this so much more complex than it needs to be. Pearl asks, so if a property sold after September and a current owner did not pay the tax, then it falls on the next owner because the tax is attached to the land. Bingo. Absolutely, Pearl. Because the, the lien is part of the land. And now here's the truth. And here's the ugly truth. If I buy a property in June, do I know for a fact that there is going, there is already a lien for property taxes owed against that property on the day I purchase it. Do I know yeah. that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And do yeah. I further know for a fact that the seller has not paid their share of that property tax bill? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes because there's no way they could have because it's not even what? It's not available. It's not even available yet. It, they owe it. It's owed, but it's not even available as a bill yet. But you just got to do the best you can do, folks. And what we're going to do is estimate and guess. That's all we can do. That is practically all we can do unless we want to wait till when. Only sell the property when? September. 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 September, October, November, when we've got the actual bill available. And we don't want to wait that long. No. From a practical standpoint. And you can't call the county and say, can you prorate my property tax bill through tomorrow? They're going to be like, get the f off my phone Definitely. because they don't need to do that. They because don't they already got a lien on it. <laughs> because they already got a lien against the property. Here's the ugly truth. Do they care who pays the bill? Nope. nope. No. no. They're I just going to say, listen, if you buy this property, you better be ready to pay that bill when it comes out in September or October. That's what they're going to tell you. Because that lien is attached to what? The land. The land. Not the, land. Land. Not the owner. Land. The land. So now that we're clear on that, when is that lien really dangerous? Liens are always dangerous, but when does that lien in particular become really dangerous in the sense that it is now delinquent and could result in the property being foreclosed? The 6th of January. January 6th of the following year. So folks who did not pay their 2021 taxes, property taxes, are they now in danger of having that property foreclosed on by their city or county? Yes. Yes, yes because we are past January 6th of 2022. So last year's property tax bill is now delinquent if it has not been satisfied. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. And by the way, if they haven't satisfied last year's, do they now have two property tax liens against the property? Yeah. yeah. Yes. We have the delinquent one from last year and the current one from this year, which is for an unknown amount already. So is that why the closing attorney is very important in the, you know, the um the sale? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because part of what they're gonna do is try to make all that fair and try to sort all that out. Everybody is there because when you think of it, when you think of a closing, a closing always happens at some point, you know, along a timeline and you have January one. OK, well, the year starts with your seller owning the property. But then out here at the end of December, you got the buyer who owns the property and closing always happens somewhere along this timeline right here. Right. When you get a closing sort of in the middle. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and what we have to try to reasonably do is estimate and the reason i say estimate is because we don't know for sure don't we have to estimate how much this seller owes for that time before closing yep yes, yes. And, and, and why does it have to be an estimate because the bill's not what not out yet calculated the bill's not yeah. out yet and and know these dates never change 
Somebody okay. asked the question in the chat, do these dates change? These dates don't change. Okay. Now, will we reach a certain point where we no longer have to estimate how much money the seller owes, where we can actually calculate the real amount the seller owes when they're selling that property? Yep. Timber. Yeah, but only when closings happen after what? September. September. After September when the bill's actually available. That's the only, when September ends. That's the only time we can be exact about it. Other than that, we're just guessing. We're guessing what we think the bill will be. And what do you think we're going to use to guess what we think the bill will be? What's the, what's the closest estimate we have? Last year's bill. Last year's bill. That's exactly what we would do. We would take last year's bill and we would guess based on last year's bill. It's exactly what we would do. There's no other, there's nothing else to do. There's no better way. If you come so up where would with you as a broker get that last year's bill from the tax assessor? From the tax assessor's <laughs> office. That's exactly right. That's a publicly available record. You can go back and look at historically available tax bills and you can see whether they've been paid too. Yep. yep. And on what date they were paid. You can mm -hmm. see when people pay their tax, uh, property taxes every year. That's all public record. Travis, I have a quick question. Are, yep. um, is, are disabled veterans 100% disabled, permanent in total? Are they exempt from this tax year? Uh, they are not, no. Okay. They are not. We do have some specific, but you don't need to worry about the homestead exemptions and stuff. And But the general answer is no, everybody pays property taxes with very rare exceptions. Government okay. don't care. They want their money. So look at this question. Which of the following is true regarding ad valorem, which just means based on value property taxes in North Carolina? A, the assessed market value of a property can change annually. B, the tax rate charged against the property can change annually. C, the amount of a property tax bill will remain unchanged for an eight-year period of time. Or D, property taxes owed for the 2022 calendar year will become late if not paid by January 6th. So y'all go into your poll everywhere and throw that answer in there and, and see what you think. Wh which one of those do you think is true of ad valorem property taxes in North Carolina? It's working again now, so I don't know. Yay. Okay. I'm going to make no comment, but I want y'all to answer. <laughs> so again, A, the assessed market value of a property can change annually. B, the tax rate charged against the property can change annually. C, the amount of a property tax bill will remain unchanged for an eight-year period of time or D, property taxes owed for the 2022 uh, calendar year will become late if not paid by January 6th of 2022. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. All right, come on. Don't wait for everybody else. Mm -hmm. I'm cheating. There's no way only five of you have answered this question. Come on. Yeah, I know. Let's I go. answered, but the number never changed. I don't know. Hmm. Interesting. Have you tried doing that? Mine, mine said it's temporarily unavailable. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Oh, it's not. It's not working. Uh, right. it having a, it's having a day. It's only working for part of you. So, I. I, I will, I'll, I'll take your word for it then, since it's not, it's not registering your answers. I see y'all answering in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if the app works better or the actual texting, but um, in any case, the answer here is that the tax rate can change annually. Some of you fell for the amount of the property tax <laughs> bill will remain unchanged. The bill does not remain unchanged, folks, right? The bill does not remain unchanged. The assessed value, the assigned value remains unchanged. What can change every year, though? Tax rate. Right. The rate, the rate can rate. change every single year. And if the rate changes, the bill will change as well, because the, the bill is calculated using both the assessed value and the rate. And so if the rate changes, the bill will change. So the bill is not locked for eight years, just the assessed value is locked for eight years. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's property taxation in North Carolina. Now, of course, I hope all of you have already watched the video when it comes to actually doing the math of calculating property taxes, um, because that's a, a separate conversation when you talk.